and um, counter plaintiff. Okay, this is case number 231743DM Kusterman versus Kusterman. Today's date is November 28th, 2023. This is a date and time set for our continued uh, hearing on all child related issues. Ms. Schmelzer, you and your client are top left to me. If you just state your names for the record, please. Lori Schmelzer, on behalf of the defendant, um, counter plaintiff Kevin Kusterman, who is also appearing via Zoom um, and present in my office today. Kevin Kusterman. Thank you, Ms. Lentz. Same with your client, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Elena Lentz on behalf of the plaintiff, Jen Klusterman, who is appearing uh, next to me via Zoom today as well. Jen, do you want to go ahead and state your name? Yeah, Jennifer Klusterman. Thank you. And um, we just had a brief discussion off the record. Uh, we were scheduled to continue with uh, Mr. Klusterman, but we have a different witness. We're going to start with that person. I believe that there's no objection. Is that correct, Ms. Lentz? Correct, Your Honor. I'm just taking this person out of order uh, so that we can um, let her go back to whatever she's going to do today. So uh, your next witness, please, Ms. Schmelzer. Um, I would like to call Mindy Hill. Thank you. Good morning. I got it at one and a quarter so we can catch up. This is uh, live, I think. Ms. Hill? Yes. Good morning. Um, you've been called as a witness in this matter by Ms. Schmelzer and her client. She's going to have some questions for you. And then if she chooses to, Ms. Lentz may have some questions for you, okay? Okay. All right. I'd ask you to raise your hand, please. Mm -hmm. Do you swear from the testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Schmelzer. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hill, can you please state your name and spell it for the record? Yep, it's Mindy Hill, M-I-N-D-Y-H-I-L-L. -L. Thank you. And where are you presently employed? Um, I'm employed with the HHS. I'm a CPS investigator. Would that be the Department of Health and Human Services of Michigan Child Protective Services? Is that what those um, abbreviations stand for? Yes. And what's your job title there? I am a CPS investigator. How long have you been employed with DHHS? Um, since 2019. Have you been um, a CPS investigator that entire time or have you changed positions? Um, I was a foster care specialist for part of that time. When did you become um, a, a CPS investigator? In February of 2022. And prior to your employment in 2019, um, have you been employed in a similar capacity elsewhere? Um, not doing this type of work, no. Um, and so what education uh, degrees, certificates, or training do you have that qualifies you for the position you hold with the Department of Health and Human Services and Child Protective Services as an investigator? Uh, my background degree is in criminal justice. I have a bachelor's in criminal justice. And then through my employment, we do various trainings um, to become a state uh, worker. You go through a nine week training right off the get go as far as training of how to do investigations, how to interview um, kind of the whole process. And then year to year you have to do um, so many hours of continued edu education as well what are your general job requirements um as a cps invest investigator just in general like what we do or yes. um i guess can you be more specific that's a like, really broad i guess as, as far as like an investigation like what we're supposed to be doing or well, I'm asking what your job requirements are um, as an investigator from a general perspective. We're just trying to get some understanding um, in that general sense. Okay. Um, well, I can kind of explain, I guess, when I get an investigation and what I'm supposed to be doing with that. Um, so when we get an investigation, um, I mean, we have allegations before us and part of it is what we have to do is we have to go see the victim children who are involved. Um, everybody in an investigation um, has to be interviewed, including the, the children, parents, any adults involved in that. Um, I mean, the overall sense is we're here to, to make sure children are safe and okay. Um, uh, we're here to provide services to families if they're not. Um, I guess I don't know exactly where you, where you want me to go with, with everything. Sure. So um, would it be fair to say that as part of your job duties, you investigate um, through various means and tools that you have available to you allegations of child abuse and neglect? Yes. And you said the word victim. Did you mean alleged victim? Um, since at the point of the initiation of an investigation, you don't know if somebody actually is a victim. Correct. Whoever's listed as a victim on our complaint. Um, 
And do you know either or both Miss Jennifer Klusterman and Mr. Kevin Klusterman? Yes. And did you come to know them in the capacity of your employment? I did. Um, did you also come to know the minor children, Kelvin, Kelsey, and Callie Klusterman? Yes. And again, was that through the capacity of your employment? It was. Um, you don't have any other knowledge or interactions with this family outside of your professional relationship, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, if you recall, when did you first come into contact with any member of this family? Um, the investigation came in over the summer. It was around the end of July. Hmm. And who was the first person in the family that you made contact with? It was Jennifer. It was my first contact with the family. And why did you choose to contact uh, Ms. Klusterman first? Um, I mean, every investigation is a little bit different. Typically, though, um, we would not contact the parent that's listed as the perpetrator first in their investigation. Um, Jennifer was listed as the non-offending parent at alleged, um, and that's kind of where we would start our investigation with. And so um, you said the end of July, would it have been you received a complaint with allegations um, around July 27th of 2023, is that correct? Yes, I believe that was the intake date. Um, do you know how the allegations came into CPS to investigate? Um, are you asking like who the reporting person was or? Well, there's various methods um, that CPS receives allegations, right? Um, there's central intake, there's forms that people fill out. Do you know how these allegations came to be on your desk to investigate? Yep. Um, so whether there's forms or calls or whatever, it all goes to centralized intake. And then they make a decision there if it's being assigned or not. And then from centralized intake, it then gets assigned to the, the local county. And then it gets assigned to you or someone in your position, correct? Yes. Um. So when you first see an allegation um, come across your desk and you're assigned to investigate it, what do you do? Um, we pick up the phone, we start making calls, we go out in the field, we make contact with individuals, um, we start the process of the investigation. And did you follow that standard procedure in this matter? Yes, I did. Um, these allegations came to CPS through a Dana McCarthy at Traverse City Women's Resource Center. Is that correct? I'm going to object because the identity of the CPS reporter is protected by statute unless this court orders her to answer, but I think that the purpose of that statute overrides the answer. Well, if that was the case, Your Honor, then I don't know why it specifically says that in one of the very first um, statements in the report that was produced by CPS to me without redaction. Um, I'm looking at page three, which I believe this report was also shared with Ms. Lentz, and it says this case was commenced with Dana McCarthy at Traverse City, uh, at Traverse WRC, and I'm simply asking Ms. Hill about the report she authored. I don't think it's necessary for us to know who submitted it. I mean, let's get to why we have this witness on this case. Um, Your Honor, if I may place on the record, uh, the reason is that these allegations ultimately, our position is they stemmed from Ms. Klusterman. And in fact, Ms. Klusterman is the only person that has made any of these allegations. I think that's important, or I'm going to argue that that's important for this court to take into consideration. Sure. I think you can ask this witness about what Ms. Klusterman has said and everything like that and get that evidence on the record. I don't think it's necessary for us to identify someone who I do believe is protected by the statute from identifying. Um, Ms. Hill, in your investigation, did you find that the person who reported these allegations had any firsthand observations of Ms. Klusterman or these three children with respect to the allegations? Um, I guess that's kind of in talking with the reporting source again. I don't want to, I guess, say something that would necessarily give the reporting source away unless I'm ordered to testify as to who the reporting source is. That's not what you're being asked. You're just being okay. asked if you're being asked if you know whether the person has firsthand knowledge. And I think it's an appropriate question. I don't believe I okay. have to order you to do anything other than answer okay. the question if you've been asked. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. no, to my knowledge, they don't have direct contact with the kids and the parents. reporting to you, to CPS, what Ms. Klusterman told them? That would be an accurate statement. Um, so going back here, July 27th, 2023, you received the allegations. Um, that, that was a Thursday, correct? I do not have a calendar in front of me, but I do believe it was uh, July 27th is when the intake came in. 
So if a, a calendar reflects that July 27th is a Thursday, you have no reason to disagree with that. No. Um, when you received these allegations, did you come to know or learn that Mr. and Mrs. Kluserman were going through a divorce? Yes, I did. Okay. And they were also going through a contested custody, um, for lack of a better word, battle at that time? Yes, it appeared to be so. Okay. Um, and were you also made aware that there was a temporary order issued by this court for joint physical and legal custody between the parents? Yes. Um, and that was something you knew as of Friday, July 28th, correct? Uh, yes, yep. That's when you spoke to Ms. Klusterman, is that July 28th, Friday? Yes. And did Ms. Klusterman share with you that Mr. Klusterman was due to receive parenting time and there was a parenting time exchange pursuant to this court's order um, scheduled for Sunday, July 30th? Yes. Um, so that was known as of Friday, July 28th, correct? Correct. What were the allegations um, that you were charged with investigating in this matter? Do you want me to like read the allegations specifically or? Or from your memory. Okay. Um, the concerns came in in regards to improper supervision and sexual abuse allegations with his oldest daughter. Um, there was concerns that Kevin was displaying grooming behaviors. Um, paying the children to do like various things, um, including t paying them to take their swim tops off, um, to swim, swim topless around their boat. Um, and there was also concerns regarding previous like domestic violence in the home as well, um, stating that the children have witnessed those interactions between their mom and dad. And did you determine at any point in the investigation to make it a joint investigation with law enforcement? Yes. Why did you do that? Um, it's CPS policy. And anytime there's a, a physical injury case or a sexual abuse um, allegations being made um, that we would send, it's called a law enforcement notification over. Um, at that point in time, they would make a decision whether or not they're going to do a joint investigation with us, which in this case they did. Um, so not all CPS investigations of alleged abuse or neglect are joint investigations with law enforcement, just certain types. Is that a fair summary of your testimony? Yes. <clears throat> and Procedurally speaking, um, even if CPS and law enforcement are jointly investigating, you each could come to a different conclusion. Is that correct? Yes. And is that simply the difference between the nature and capacity of each branch of the government you're working with, law enforcement versus CPS? Correct. There's different statutes, I guess you could say, criminal versus CPS. And so sometimes you guys come to the same conclusion, sometimes different. Is that fair? Yes. So what's, I guess, what's the point of the joint investigation then, um, if you're, you're ultimately making your own independent conclusion? Um, if any complaint comes in, could have a, a, could be criminal in nature. So typically something that's physical abuse um, or sexual abuse can be also criminal in nature, where a parent could be charged um, if the allegations are found to be true. So I guess to, to question differently, um, why jointly investigate instead of independently each investigate? Um, the, the purpose of the, the joint investigations for one um, is to not be interviewing people multiple times, especially when it comes to children. Um, in the specific case, the children were interviewed at the Children's Advocacy Center, um, but really it's just so that there's not multiple people talking to getting multiple different interviews in, in that sense. And at, at that point, um, also would it be fair to say that if there's a joint investigation, CPS and law enforcement are sharing information and receiving the same information in their investigations. Yes, typically that's how it would work. Um, kind of turning back um, to Friday, July 28th, you spoke with and interviewed Ms. Klusterman um, upon opening the investigation, correct? Um, I had like my initial contact, I guess you could say, with her. Um, and with speaking with Ms. Klusterman at that, um, I guess that initial contact is what I'm talking about. Did she relay facts that she believed supported the allegations you were investigating? Um, yes, yes, we talked about the allegations and basically that in her eyes, those things were truthful. And you came to learn that the source of those allegations was Ms. Klusterman, whether she made the report or not. Correct. Um, Throughout your entire investigation, did anyone that you contact or interview other than Ms. Klusterman or someone that was repeating what Ms. Klusterman told 
them relay any facts of firsthand observations they made independently to support these allegations? No, it was not found in this investigation that those were supported, I guess, or found to be truthful. So the sole source of the allegations was Ms. Klusterman or somebody she told something to that had no other independent knowledge, right? Correct. Okay. Um, at the conclusion of uh, the conclusion of meeting with Ms. Klusterman, did you determine that you needed to interview the children or that they needed um, to be interviewed in general? After my first contact with Ms. Klusterman? Correct. Yes. Um, and, and again, in any investigation, we would have we can't just stop after one contact is made. We have to follow through and make sure everybody is contacted and interviewed. Um, did you interview the children that day? Not on Friday, no. Why not? Um, so when there's a, whenever there's, again, allegations of sexual abuse or something in that nature, typically what we would like to do is have the children interviewed at the Children Advocacy Center. Um, that's the I guess plan A in most cases that's the best um, outcome to do it there it was also a joint investigation so we cannot move forward with interviewing a child without law enforcement's lead as well um in every incident of you investigating allegations of abuse or neglect do you always schedule appointments for children to be interviewed at the children's advocacy center or is that just sometimes um that is sometimes but typically in a, in a manner of this we would do that almost every time yes so specifically, why in this particular case did you choose that option of interviews at the CAC, the Children's Advocacy Center? Due to the concerns of the sexual abuse allegations and because it was a joint investigation with law enforcement and we were taking their lead as to what they wanted to do. Um, what's the difference between you interviewing right then and there at the home, the children, versus doing it at the Children's Advocacy Center? CPS has no way to record a conversation um, so what? So if we don't have law enforcement with us, it's not recorded at the CAC. It is recorded. Um, and so it was important for you to determine that this interview needed to be recorded with these children in this case. Again, it's because it's a joint investigation with law enforcement. We don't have that option to move forward without the lead of law enforcement. And that was the decision made for this case. Um, at the time that you were talking to Ms. Klusterman on Friday the 28th, um, knowing that the children were due to the exchange with Mr. Klusterman on Sunday, what was discussed regarding that? There was a safety plan put in place that until the children could be interviewed, they would stay with their with their mother. When you did that safety plan, who made that determination? Who was the one who had the idea to put that on that piece of paper? Uh, myself and talking with my supervisor. Okay. And did you inform Ms. Klusterman that CPS did not have the legal authority to advise her or tell her in any way that she could violate a court order? Um, I don't believe, I don't understand, I don't remember, I guess, our specific conversation. I do believe that has came up um, in conversation with her. I know I too reached out to friend of the court in regards to the safety plan um, to let them know that we were involved and that we did put that in place. Um, I believe I, I sent friend of the court a copy of that safety plan as well. Well, I guess, do you believe you have the authority to tell parents to violate court orders? Um, we don't necessarily have the authority, but in cases like this, we do create safety plans and sometimes a, a parent will, will file for a parenting time violation. Um, my, most of the cases, I would say they don't. They try to work it out later um, after the investigation's over, um, but we do this in many cases. You spoke to me on Friday, July 28th, didn't you? I believe so. And your supervisor spoke to me as well, correct? Yes, I believe so. Um, and there was discussion about the fact that CPS did not have legal authority to tell Ms. Klusterman to violate a court order, correct? Yes. Did you relay that to Ms. Klusterman at that time? Um, honestly, I don't recall the specifics in the conversations. I know me and Ms. Klusterman did have several text communication conversations on the phone. I don't know exactly on that day if we talked about it the day after. If your report says CPS Hill let Jennifer know that CPS could not trump a, a FOC court order, but that she may still safety plan with her that she will keep the children until interviews were completed, does that jog your memory as to what happened or what conversation was had with Ms. Klusterman? Yes. 
Okay, so is it your recollection that you did in fact tell Ms. Kusterman that you had no authority to tell her to violate this court's order? Yes. Okay. Um, nonetheless, part of the safety plan was that she would violate the court's order by keeping the children from the exchange on Sunday that was court ordered, correct? Yes, that would be violating the court order. And I, I was asking more that that was part of the safety plan, right? And did you tell Ms. Klosterman that she needed to talk to her lawyer about that before she did it? I may have said that you can talk with your lawyer. Um, again, CPS safety plans are voluntary. We write them down. We hope parents follow them. That's, I guess, as far as a safety plan, I can just say that they're voluntary with parents. Did you tell Ms. Klosterman that the safety plan was voluntary? Um, I don't know specifically what I what I said as to that. Um, so I, I can't, I, don't, I guess I don't recall specifically what I said about that. So if you told me when we talked on Friday, July 28th, that the safety plan was directed by Ms. Klusterman, you communicated to her that she needed to talk to her lawyer and that it was voluntary. Was your communication to me correct or incorrect on July 28th with respect to what you told Ms. Klusterman? As far as what do you, I guess, what do you mean? You told me all those things that you relayed to Ms. Klusterman, she needed to talk to her lawyer, that you didn't have the authority to tell her to violate a court order, that, um, that the safety plan was voluntary and that the safety plan was directed by Ms. Klusterman. That's all the things that you told me. So when you told me those things on Friday, July 28th, was that a true statement of what you told Ms. Klusterman that day? Yes, I believe so. And the conversations that we had, yes. When was the interview with the children scheduled to occur at the Children's Advocacy Center, the CAC? Um, it was scheduled the following week. I believe it was Tuesday of the following week. Would that have been August 1st of 2023? Correct. And when these interviews were conducted, were they joint or separate? Meaning were all the children together or separated? They're all separated individually. Um, was either parent in any of the interviews or was it just the children by themselves? Which only the children with the, the interviewer in the room. Okay. Who conducted the interviews, do you know? Um, it was a staff member at the, the Children's Advocacy Center. Um, I don't recall her name off the top of my head. There's a couple different ones. Were you present to observe these interviews firsthand? Yes. Um, we're, we're, I guess, not present as far as the, from the child perspective. It's behind a, a video screen. We're in a separate room. Okay. Um, but you were watching these interviews live, is that correct? Correct. But as far as the children knew, it was just them and the person, the interviewer that we don't know the name of. Yes. Um, are you trained in something called forensic interviewing of children? Yes, I am. Can you explain to the court what forensic interviewing means? Um, forensic interview is basically a protocol that's followed. Um, you would start out with, typically, if you're following the protocol exactly step by step, you would start out with introductions. You would talk about a neutral topic to build a rapport with a child. Um, you would do kind of a, a practice interview, essentially, with them um, for them to kind of speak regarding details. Um, you would go over the forensic interview rules um, to make sure they have an understanding. Those rules are um, to always tell the truth. You go over the difference between a truth and a lie. Um, you go over to correct the person speaking if they're wrong, um, to never guess an answer and to ask if they don't understand something and just making sure that they understand each of those by giving examples if needed. Um, then a uh, forensic interview is it's child led. So we're not asking leading questions. We're asking open-ended questions, clarifying questions. Um, and that's kind of the, the process. And is it fair to say then that the point of going through this process with children is to determine if a child's statements are a truth or a lie? Um, yes. Um, what training have you had on how to conduct forensic interviews with children? Uh, we have that initially in our nine-week training. Um, over the course of three days, we go through it. Uh, then various times, year after year, we have different one-day trainings. Um, just various things that come up that we can do a refresher. 
And what training, if you know, was the person who conducted the interviews? Um, what training did they have on how to conduct forensic interviews with children? They would have the same training. So anyone, whether it's law enforcement, CPS, um, you have to go through a three-day forensic interview training for initial, I guess, certification. And since you're trained and certified in forensic interviewing of children, if you're observing somebody else forensically interviewing a child, you would, is it fair to say you'd be able to detect whether they're doing it right or wrong? Yes. Um, and your observations of the interviews with these children in this matter, were the proper forensic interview protocols followed? Yes. And were you and the interviewer and law enforcement, were you able to determine or make a judgment that these children were, um, were understanding the difference between telling a truth and a lie? Yes, they all were. Um, and were the children in this matter, were they cooperative and open in the interviews and answering questions and providing information? Yes. Do you know the, the ages of these children? Um, I'm probably not gonna get them right. I believe 15, uh, 13 and nine maybe. Uh, if, if Kelsey was 10 at the oh, time okay. of the investigation, does that sound right? Yes. Um, 10, 13, 15. Um, do ages matter when you're trying to determine if a child is telling a truth or a lie or, or their statements are reliable? Um, yes, I mean, they have to be able to answer, I guess, the forensic interview rules correctly. We usually give examples, and if they get them wrong and don't understand the rules, then it's not really a, I guess you can say, forensic interview. So, for example, if you were interviewing a two-year-old child, that would be different than interviewing a 10-year-old child, just simply where they are developmentally. Is that fair to say? Yes. With a 10, 13, 15-year-old in general, would, would you expect that child to be more developmentally advanced to be able to disclose and share information truthfully? Yes. And in this particular case, were there any, were you aware of any sort of learning or cognitive impairments that any of these children have that may have affected um, any of their statements in these interviews? Um, no, they all seemed like very bright children. Um, with respect to Callie, uh, when she was interviewed, did, did she corroborate any of the allegations, deny them, not say anything? What happened there? Um, so we don't like necessarily read the allegations to the child. It's more open-ended questions, getting information out of them. Um, and through the disclosures, there was nothing, I guess, brought up in regards to the allegations, uh, no matter what the interviewer tried to, I guess, press a little bit. Um, like I said, we're not directly asking the allegations to the child because it has to be open-ended. We can't ask leading questions, um, but there was never any disclosures um, of any concerns. I mean, do you talk about, you know, body safety or um, generalize what the topic is of the allegations? Correct. Yes. And, and do you ask about safety concerns? Yes. Yep. And there, um, through any of the interviews, there was no disclosures of any concern. They're feeling uncomfortable with dad or around dad or going over to his house. Um, they're just. And, there and we'll get to that in a moment. I, I want to talk about Callie right now. Um, okay. So she made no dis no concerns about safety in either parent's home. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, did she talk at all about the allegation or, or make any statements regarding the allegation that Ms. Klusterman made that Mr. Klusterman was kissing her anywhere other than the forehead? Um, so just, I think one of the allegations was up and down the leg. Did she say anything um, about that? I'm going to object. I believe the witness testified that there was no concerns disclosed by the child. I think we're trying to circumvent hearsay here and get into exactly what the child said. I think the testimony that there was no disclosure is sufficient. Well, for purposes of this hearing, I agree. But I mean, she can say whether or not she said that she didn't go over the exact allegations with the child. So we already know that the child didn't relay any information. Are you are you just trying to follow up on more specific allegations, Mr. Meltzer, that you know there's well, no evidence, there's no testimony on? Well, yes, and I, I would argue also, this is a, an exception to the hearsay rule because it is the investigation of an allegation of abuse or neglect and the children's statements in response to that. Um, you know, here, here's where we're going, though, is Ms. Klusterman made a lot of very specific allegations, and we're looking into an investigation about them because Ms. Klusterman also brought those up when we were here a month ago. I think we're all aware they were was, unsubstantiated, and there was no she testified. She testified to them in her direct testimony, and I'm presenting 
contrary evidence. That's kind of, isn't that what the court proceeding, what court is? It is, but my, I guess the issue is, you know that the children didn't say anything related to the allegations. So what more, isn't that the answer you want anyway? What What are you, What? how, how much more do you want than that? As much as I think that we're, I mean, what I know is not what the court knows. I mean, that's what this exercise is, is informing the court of all the information necessary to make a decision. So I know a lot of stuff. I'm sure Ms. Lentz knows a lot of stuff, but we're here trying to bring witnesses to inform the court of the stuff we know um, that's relevant to these proceedings. Right. But by that own admission, you know that she's, this witness isn't going to disclose anything like that because she's already testified. She doesn't. So you're asking questions that you already know the answer to, which is there's nothing there. Why well, I mean, that's, that's, that's that trial practice 101 is never ask a witness a question you don't know the answer to, but I, I don't know what you know, Your Honor. That's the issue is I'm trying to inform the court. That's the exercise of the judicial process. I don't believe that we're going to be able to get into the children's statements in this. You can. I don't think that your question in and of itself, look, I'll be honest, I don't think that the question to which there was an objection pending right now was inappropriate, but I think that it's just superfluous. I think you're just asking basically the same question over and over again in a different way. You know that there was, this wasn't some substantiated this witness this witness already testified so we i know if you keep saying it that way the court does know that there wasn't anything said during this interview and now you're just asking the same question in a different way did they say this did they say this and you already know and i already know they did it so if it helps we can stipulate that the investigation was unsubstantiated and the children didn't disclose anything no. And, and, and I don't want to, I, I think that it's okay if you're getting to, if you're asking questions about whether you believe Ms. Kusterman was telling the truth or whatever, I think that the, those are appropriate and I've already allowed those. I don't believe that's what you're doing right now. You are asking about what the children said. I, I'm asking about, I didn't ask the specific statements of the children. I know, I understand that that was the objection, but I'm asking about the specific allegations Ms. Kusterman made and the investigation. And I mean, this all goes to, impeachment issues of Ms. Klusterman. I mean, Ms. Klusterman opened the door. She did. She testified that she believed these things were occurring in October when we were here, fully knowing this investigation had been concluded and she had been informed of the outcome of it. I wouldn't have this witness here had Ms. Ms. Klusterman not opened that door. And, and I would like to make the record to fully explore those issues because it not only goes to impeachment issues, it also goes to um, the issue of the, the weight that this court may or may not put on Ms. Klusterman being the only one making allegations, um, which parent is willing to facilitate a close and continuing relationship with um, the children. And, you know, my job is to present all of the information because I don't know what the court knows or doesn't know. I don't know what the court, furthermore, I'm, I'm making a record for my client of all of the information that is available to this court. That's all I'm doing is asking those questions so that the court has all of the information. Um, I, I don't fully understand the, I guess what I'm hearing is the court saying, I have enough information, stop giving me more. And I believe it's my duty as a lawyer to present all of the information, whether the court weighs it or considers it is what happens after all of the information is presented. That's not what I said at all. That's a total mischaracterization. The issue is you, you can ask, I, the way you framed the question, you asked what the child said. So you're, you aren't asking about Ms. Klusterman. So my, my point is, you're, you're, here, here's the issue. You're now getting into, I believe you're, you're saying there's a specific allegation of kissing in an inappropriate way. I'll summarize it that way. This witness already testified that the children didn't substantiate any of the allegations. So if you're saying that's an allegation, you're just rephrasing that question. That's all I'm saying. It's not, I'm not preventing you from asking the, uh, the same question a different way. It's just, you have to determine whether it's necessary to go through all these things when you know that the court does know, you know for a fact, the court knows that none of these allegations were substantiated. Whether you state them specifically or broadly, you are aware of that based on the testimony that was presented not two minutes ago. So that's up to you. But I am, I'm not really gonna get into whether the children are specifically saying this or that based on the allegations. Because I don't know if the children know, we can ask if, the, Ms. Hill, do the children know what the exact allegations are? No. From your knowledge? No. Okay. And do you know whether you've informed Ms. Meltzer of that? Do you know whether she knows whether or not you read the allegations to the children? Um, I mean, we haven't had that. I don't think we've had that conversation, but we wouldn't you have. You may not have had that specific yeah. conversation with her before today, but didn't you testify to that today? Yes. Was yes. Ms. Meltzer on the Zoom box when you said that? Yes. All right. Your Honor, this is not about what I know or don't know. I mean, let's my move job on. Is to Next question. To Next Thank question. You. Um. Ms. Hill, one of the allegations specifically that Ms. Klusterman made was with respect to Callie, that Mr. Klusterman would kiss her from hip and down her leg. Was that the allegation that you were investigating? That was part of it, yeah. 
And in Callie's interview, was there any questioning or discussion about the appropriateness of Mr. Klusterman kissing his daughter? Um, I guess in a roundabout way that was tried to be brought up as far as like bedtime routine or different things or boundaries and that stuff. Um, and that was never disclosed specifically from the child. There was nothing to indicate that any kissing would be outside of the normal parent child appropriate relationship. Yes. Did, did you feel that in the interview, Kelly was invited if something like that was occurring, she was invited and had the open opportunity to discuss it? Yes. And again, she did not. No. Did Kelly appear to be truthful in your observations in her interviewing? Yes. And do you have any reason to believe in your training and judgment that she was not telling the truth or was coached or afraid to tell the truth? No. Um, then now I'm turning to the interview with Kelsey. Um, did she make any disclosures? No, she did not. Uh, again, did you invite her in, in, not you, I'm sorry, the interview and your observations, the interviewer, did the interviewer invite her um, to have an open space to talk about anything related to those allegations? I know you didn't ask specific questions, but were those topics sort of initiated? Yes. Okay. And again, did Kelsey make any disclosures or um, statements that made you believe that these allegations had any merit? Um, no, there was no concerns noted. Okay. And did Kelsey appear truthful in her interview? Yes. Um, did you have any reason to believe that she, Kelsey, again, um, was not telling the truth, was coached or afraid to tell the truth? No. And did Kelsey confirm that she felt safe with both parents? Yes. Um, not just safe, but that she had a relationship with both parents. Yes. And um, you also interviewed Kelvin, which is um, the 15 year old son, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And did he make any statements or uh, disclosures about safety concerns in either parent's household? No, he did not. Did he appear truthful in his interview and in your observations and training? Yes. Any reason to believe that Kelvin was not telling the truth, was coached or afraid of either parent? No. Um, any disclosures about physical um, abuse or violence between the parents in front of the children by any of the children? Um, without, I guess, rereading the interviews, I do recall there being something brought up, and I'm not sure by which child, but regarding, like, parents arguing, like, or fighting, that kind of stuff, um, but nothing that would necessarily make us substantiate, I guess, for improper supervision based on our policy definition. And fair to say, adult parents sometimes argue, right? That's not uncommon. Yes. My specific question was as to physical, um, getting physical during those arguments. None of the children disclosed that, did they? In regards to their parents or like to them or to the, to them, to the children or to the parents, to each other, I guess what? Physical I don't think it matters. I read your report. There's, <laughs> okay. I mean, do you need a minute to refresh your recollection on your report? I was just making sure I understood your question correctly. There's no physical, there was no discussion of any of the children of physical violence in the home. No. Is that correct? Yes. Um, immediately following the interviews with the children, did you speak with Ms. Klusterman um, while she was there at the Children's Advocacy Center? Yes. What did you share with Ms. Klusterman? Uh, we had discussed that um, none of the children had made any disclosures at this time that were of concern and we had discussed that there was not a need to extend the safety plan um, any further and then I had called I believe Kevin after that um, and discussed that the parenting time could resume. Who else did you interview or meet with during the course of your investigation? Um. I met with Kevin's mom, um, Kevin, when we met um, at your office. Um, I mm, trying to recall who else I talked with. 
I can't recall off the top of my head who else I talked with. Um, so Ms. Klusterman, Mr. Klusterman, the three children, and Mr. Klusterman's mother. Um, you can't recall talking to anyone else. Um, law enforcement. Um, I know I talked with the Women's Resource Center at one point um, in case conferences with like my supervisor. And throughout the course of the investigation, the allegations made um, and your interviews, if something had come up that you felt you needed to talk to someone else, a teacher, a therapist, a doctor, would you have done that? Yes. Okay, so I mean, part of the investigation, you're following a trail. Is that fair to say? You're gathering information and then determining if you need to gather more information, right? Um, Correct. And in this particular case, you didn't feel that there was a need to speak with anyone else, that nothing came up that said, oh, I, you know, you need to talk to the doctor or you need to talk to a teacher, right? Correct. And throughout the course of your investigation, again, the only person the sole person that had believed she had firsthand knowledge of anything, including interviewing with the children, was all Miss Klusterman, right? Correct. Not a single other person that you worked with in the course of this investigation made any allegations or brought forth any facts that they saw themselves personally that caused you concern for these children. Correct. Um, did you ultimately close the investigation? Yes, it was. Do you recall when you did that, when you closed the investigation? Um, it would have been right around the end of August, I believe. Um, and what was your ultimate conclusion when you closed the investigation? Um, that it was unsubstantiated. Um, uh, and what does unsubstantiated mean? Uh, like no preponderance being found for what the allegations were, which was improper supervision and sexual abuse. And what does preponderance mean? Um, so to substantiate an investigation, um, you have to find a, I guess, preponderance. And what I believe for a criminal matter would be like at least... Beyond a reasonable doubt for a CPS matter, there has to be a preponderance is what they call it. Um, just that there's evidence, some type of evidence that this is truthful. So would it be fair to characterize it as you would have to find something that indicates more likely than not versus the criminal standard of beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes. Um, so you would agree there's kind of like a lesser standard for CPS before they make a finding versus law enforcement. Is that kind of why you guys do um, joint in, joint investigations, but you can come to separate conclusions? Correct. Um, and so in this particular case, you found that there was no indication of any evidence of any of the allegations. Correct. Um, and if you dated, um, I apologize, if you're, if you dated your report September 6th of 2023 as to when you concluded your investigation officially, does that sound correct? Yes. Um, so you fully, do you feel like you fully investigated this in over a month's time, almost six weeks? Yes. Do you feel confident in your conclusion? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, did law enforcement also close the investigation with no charges or further action taken? Yes, they did. When, I guess let me strike that. Did you inform Ms. Klusterman of the outcome of your investigation? I did. Do you recall about when you did so? Um, typically right around when I submit my report, I will follow up with parents and let them know that I'm closing it out. And you, did you share with Ms. Klusterman, you found no indication that any of the allegations were true or believable or 
there was just simply nothing. Did you inform her of that? I don't believe I used those exact words, but yes, that we were closing out the investigation. What words did you use? Um, just that there was not like enough evidence. And at this time we're closing out the investigation. Um, enough evidence versus no evidence. Honestly, I don't know the specific words I use in my conversation with her. Did you make it clear to her that it was CPS's position that uh, this probably wasn't happening? I mean, I don't recall our conversation being super long, more just a touch base that, hey, like we're closing out this report um, at this time, we don't have enough to do anything with it. And so there were no further safety plans or services offered to the family as a result of these allegations? No. And you believe that conversation was had with Ms. Klusterman sometime around the beginning of September, correct? Yes. I have no further questions for this witness. Thank you. Ms. Lentz, do you have any questions for this witness? Just briefly, Your Honor. Hi, Ms. Hill. Um, when this report initially came in, was there a reference to text messages? Um, you mean from like parents, like just text? Yes, there was some reference to that. So in a reference to text messages, uh, do you know, was the reference in regard to conversations between Mr. and Mrs. Klusterman? Yes. So in this whole, Ms. Klusterman's the only one that's made these allegations and their verbal allegations. There was actually documents in the form of text messages to support her claims, correct? I believe there was like a screenshot she had shared, yes. And okay. did Ms. Klusterman actually text Thank you God. a picture of that screenshot text message that was referenced by the initial reporter? Yes, she did. Okay, so be fair to say Ms. Klusterman isn't just pulling this out of thin air. She had some form of documents to support her claims. Yes. And Ms. Hill, um, when you do an initial report or follow up on a call, do you research if there's been any previous CPS involvement with that specific family? Yes, we do. And was there pre or previous CPS involvement with the Klusterman family? Um, there was, and I'm trying to recall off the top of my head, um, I believe it was a couple of years ago, um, but there was. And to your knowledge, were those previous involvements or previous involvement substantiated in terms of CPS lingo? Or... Um, would I have time to pull it up real quick to refresh my memory or? No, if you can't remember, that's all right. Okay. Uh, Ms. L, is it common for CPS workers to um, develop a safety plan? Yes, it is. And you testified that this particular safety plan, um, it was created by you and your supervisor. Is that correct? Yes. So to be clear, it was not Ms. Klusterman who put that language in the safety plan. Correct. Ms. Hill, do you think it puts parents, for lack of a better phrase, between a rock and a hard place when they have a safety plan and a parenting oh, time Lord. order in place to decide what one to follow? Yes. And you testified earlier that it's CPS hope that they follow the safety plan. Is that correct? Yes. Ms. Hill, is it possible for someone to have a belief even though CPS says otherwise? Objection, yeah. speculation. How would She's she know what somebody, specifically Ms. Klusterman, believes? I didn't specify Ms. Klusterman, Your Honor. I'm asking anyone. anyone. And it's even more, it's even more speculation. I think you can follow up with some foundation questions. I don't know how speculative sure. it is, but you could follow up and then easily fill that in. Ms. Hill, in general, do you ever have parents that continue to believe abuse, neglect, whatever is happening, even though CPS has unsubstantiated their claims? Yes. 
And Miss Hill, I'm sure you do great work, so don't take this personally. Is it possible for CPS ever to be incorrect with their conclusion? Yes, I would say it's a possibility. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect, Ms. Schmelzer? Thank you. Um, Ms. Hill, there was a question about a text message, one single text message between Mr. and Mrs. Klusterman, correct? Yes. And that was over five years old at the point that you were investigating, is that fair to say? Uh, yes, I believe it was from 2018. And that was solely provided and generated by Ms. Klusterman, no one else, right? Correct. And Mr. Klusterman was asked about that text message, wasn't he? Yes. That text message was not documentation supporting Ms. Klusterman's claims, was it? There was something in the text message related to the swimming. I, I can't remember specifically what it said. It, it was, I guess, strange the way it was worded in there. I can't specifically say. It, they're just, because it was from five years ago and that, that was all we had, there wasn't enough. I discussed with law enforcement. Um, I'm not saying that it was nothing. Um, Mr. Klusterman didn't recall sending that text um, and or informed you that it was taken out of context. Isn't that correct when you investigated it? Yeah, the concern was brought up regarding maybe there was like a typo or that it just, I don't know, there was a lot of different things, I guess, that we kind of talked about regarding that text message. On its face, that text message in and of itself did not show that there was abuse happening, did it? If you just read it totally in isolation. Yes, that'd be accurate. Okay. And have you ever seen people, even in your own life, in your investigations, they make typos in texts, right? Yes. Happens all the time. Yeah, I mean, it can happen, sure. And you mentioned that that text message was from five years ago. Did that influence whether you believed that that single solitary one and only thing was enough to do anything with this matter? No. Um, do you take concern with a parent who brings about something that occurred five years ago, five years after the fact? Does that weigh into your investigation at all? Concern with the parent as in regard. I would just argue anything. this. Well, let me state this differently. If a parent's truly concerned about abuse or neglect occurring, save it for argument. Do you consider you've done the a fact good job? They waited five years to tell somebody waited until a divorce is pending, waited until a custody battle is ongoing before they brought it up. Is is that something you take into context? Um, I mean, I don't know exactly how to answer that. Again, I mean, we just talked about the text message not being anything in and of itself. So I don't know that at that time, maybe that parent even could recall that being something. Um, so I, I guess I, I don't know how to exactly answer that. Let me ask this. Did the fact that the text message was five years old have any influence on how much weight or consideration you gave it in your investigation? Yes. And what weight or consideration did you give it considering it was five years old? Um just that it just wasn't recent in time in regards to to the allegations um and that was just like a one small piece that we had of it fair answer um and she provided nothing else in between 2018 and present um 
Not that I like if you mean a documentation, something like that, or correct. Um, not that I recall. And your testimony was that this text message was provided to you as a screenshot from Miss Klusterman to you, right? Yes. And you have no indication whether it could have or was altered in any way or not. I wouldn't have a way of knowing that, I guess. Um. <clears throat> With respect to the safety plan, <clears throat> how do you explain that you told me on Friday, July 28th, that the safety plan was directed by the parent and your testimony today was that it was directed by you and your supervisor? I guess I, I don't recall you saying it was directed by the, or I guess I don't recall that, the conversation that me and you had. You recall that there were a lot of phone calls between you, me, and your supervisor on Friday, July 28th, discussing the fact that CPS doesn't have the authority to tell a parent to deny parenting time ordered under a court order, correct? Yes, that is correct. We did a voluntary safety plan with the parent. And you told me on July 28th that that safety plan was directed by the parent, not you and your supervisor. Is that correct? Yes. I don't I don't recall saying that specifically to you. <clears throat> I don't know in what investigation I've ever had a safety plan being directed by a parent. That's always coming from us working with a parent. Okay, so was that something you were just saying to me because I was pointing out that CPS didn't have the authority to do that? And so you said that to me? Again, I don't recall saying those words to you. I guess I'm sorry if it was misconstrued, but in any investigation I've ever done, um, we work with parents, we do safety plans, but I've never had a parent direct a safety plan. After... Is it your position today that CPS has the authority to tell a parent to violate a court order by retaining children? I mean, I think it's made clear that CPS doesn't have the authority. I mean, what I can say again is we safety plan. We hope parents work with us. The safety plans are voluntary. Lots of times I'll follow up a friend of the court to let them know. I don't know what else I can say, I guess, in regards to that. Do you believe that in this instance, you were clear in, with Ms. Klusterman that the safety plan was voluntary and that you did not have the authority to tell her to violate this court's order? Yes, we had that conversation. I have no further questions. Any final questions, Ms. Lentz? Uh, just briefly, Your Honor, Ms. Hill, do you have any knowledge as to if Ms. Klusterman returned the children immediately following um, the interview on Tuesday? Yes, I believe they went right to Kevin's that day. One second, Your Honor. Thank you. And Ms. Hill, the text message that was referenced, um, it was kind of teed up to be a typo. When you interpreted that text message, did you think it was a typo? I think we talked about a lot of different possibilities. And I know we had this conversation with law enforcement too. Um, did I think that was strange in a text? Yes. But we also had, again, kind of all these other things that it could have been. Um, and one of them that was shared was like, you know, is it a possibility that this was a typo? And Ms. Hill, to be clear, um, mm -hmm. it was phrased that like Miss Klusterman is the one bringing up these allegations. Um, she was not the reporter of this investigation. Objection. This goes beyond the scope. 
mean, she could have asked it in her original cross. This is recross. I, I didn't bring up any of this in redirect. Well, to, to be fair, I believe that Ms. Lentz, you objected to this exact issue as to who identified. And so I'm going to continue my ruling. Okay. Ooh. I didn't expect that. And in my question, I'm not asking for the identity be, to be disclosed. I'm just asking if it's Ms. Klosterman. Uh, I'll allow that. Okay. My and objection I, again is it goes beyond the scope. I understand. Overall. I think, okay. Ms. L, was Ms. Klosterman the initial reporter? No, she was not. So this testimony about Ms. Klusterman brought this up five years later and Ms. Klusterman, all that, that's not accurate because Ms. Klusterman was not the reporter, correct? Oh, here we go. She, yeah, she was not the reporter, correct. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. Sure. Thank you. You're Your Honor, awesome. do I get redirect since this was my you witness? Got, yep, you got redirect. This is the final questions. Well, she got to cross last. All right, next witness. And I called the witness. And, your next and witness, she, please. Oh, good lord. Um, your Honor, for the record, I would like to do another redirect and ask because Miss Lentz went beyond the scope of her original cross and the original redirect. And I have a follow-up question based on what she just said. And this was my witness originally. I know. I, I disagreed with, with whether or not you had that opportunity. You did. Next witness. Um, Your Honor, I argue that I did not. You have made, you've made your record. You're welcome to file that in an objection following this hearing. Your next witness, please. For the record, I would like to call Miss Mindy Hill and ask a follow-up question. Woo, it's getting chippy. I, th I thought she was going to get another redirect, too. Honestly. Your Honor, I'm, I'm asking to call Miss Mindy Hill. I have not released her. I as understand a that. Next witness. Miss Mindy Hill. Okay. If you have no further witnesses, then I guess we're all. Oh, set I have further you. witnesses, but I'm calling. I'm recalling Miss Mindy Hill, and I did not release her as a witness. She's under subpoena, and I'm. The calling court. The court released her. Your Honor, I didn't release her from subpoena, so I'm recalling Miss Mindy Hill. Ooh. The court released that witness. I followed the same exact format with every single witness, and you know that. Your Honor, you direct, I don't believe so. You get direct, I believe Ms. You get Lentz cross, was always given the you opportunity. Get redirect, to ask. She has final questions with the other attorney, and we're all set. I don't believe that she went beyond the scope. You're saying that. We just disagree. That's okay. I disagree with whether or not you had an opportunity to fully examine that witness. We're all Your set. Honor, I release during, the witness. The I'm not going to argue with you anymore. We're either going to go on to the next witness or I'll end this hearing right now. I'll call Kevin Klusterman, but I. For the record, I would Her objection like is Ms. noted. You, you, that's perfectly fine. Everything is fine. You can file an objection to that. That's the way it works. Your Honor, I disagree. I have clear notes that indicate oh, that when All right, Mr. Klosterman, would you raise your right hand, please? <clears throat> do you swear from the testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Sir, do you recall that we were here on October 17th and October 18th, um, and you testified on that date, on October 18th? Yes. Um, and you were already sworn in under oath at that time? Correct. And due to time constraints, we were unable to continue your redirect on that date? Correct. And that's why we're here today? Is that, that correct? That is correct, Okay. Yes. So we're picking up sort of where we left off. Um, and incorporating your prior testimony. Um, and I believe the best interest factor that we were on was D, the length of time the child has lived in a stable, satisfactory environment and the desirability of maintaining continuity. Um, so just kind of laying the groundwork for where we are, okay? Yes. Okay, fair enough. Um, do you provide the children with a stable home environment? Yes, absolutely. And how do you do that? Um... I take care of them. I give them the things that they need. Um, I, um, I parent them. I uh, give them the meals they need. I help them and advise them to do their, their homework, give them a place to sleep and shower, give them all the food, the things that they need. Um, we try to live by a routine, uh, support them in any way that I can. And there was some 
change in housing during the course of this divorce temporarily. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. Okay. And so where were you living temporarily during times during this divorce proceeding? I've been living with my parents. Is their home suitable and appropriate for the children? Yes, absolutely. Plenty of space, bedrooms, things like that. Yes, they all have their own space. And you and Ms. Klusterman reached a property settlement agreement that you will be retaining and moving back into the marital home. Is that correct? That is correct. And that's the home the children have been moved, or living in for how many years? Uh, we've been there for three years. Okay. Um, and that's where the children were on the weeks that Ms. Klusterman had parenting time with them during the course of this. That is correct, yes. Um, and that home has always been suitable and satisfactory. Yep, yep absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Plenty of bedrooms for the kids in that home. Yep, each of the kids have their own bedroom. And... Uh, when do you expect to be moving back into that home? Do you know? Uh, hope, hopefully soon. Um, it's been quite a process to get my uh, to mortgage, uh, doing it all on my own. Um, should have that uh, wrapped up this week so I can get Jen her check. And then uh, we'll go from there. And what was the property agreement, if you recall, as to the timing of those things? Um, I believe I have to have her money to her by December 19th. And then she has 30 days to uh, leave. And your plan is to move back into that home? And it is as soon as Jen moves out and allows me in. Okay. Um, and the kids will have the same bedrooms they've always had and things like that in that home. Yep, yep. We've talked about how we will make it our home. Um, I mean, this best interest factor talks about stability, but would it be fair to say when you go from one home to two homes, there is a little bit of instability. Um, how have the kids been adjusting as this process has moved from, you know, having their parents in one home versus two homes? Um, it's definitely been an adjustment. Um, the, the youngest struggled at time early on. Um, I don't think it was as big of a deal as what Jen has made it to be. Um, but of course there's going to be an adjustment there. Of course they're comfortable being at my parents, grand, their grandparents. But um, leaving their home or their bedroom, that's definitely an adjustment, but they've, they've handled it well. Um, there are times they, they show up and they're like, I just, I just want to be in one place. I want to be in my bedroom. And it's not, it's not that they're saying they, they don't want to be with me or they don't want to be with Jen or it's they want to be in that space. But uh, usually, uh, I mean, Sunday, they're, they're, they come to me tired. No. Uh, they go home to Jen probably tired, so she probably deals with the same sort of thing. It's it's an adjustment that takes them probably a day to adjust back into the swing of things of where they are. But they've been fantastic. Uh, they've adjusted well. They are um, anxious to get back into the home. Um, they're hoping it's before Christmas. Um, but is it? I mean, is it fair to say that? Since Ms. Klusterman's going to be moving out of the marital home, uh, the kids are going to have to go through an adjustment of the new space that she's going to be in, too. Yeah, it'll be an adjustment for them again. And, and I hope to help them with that and encourage them with that. I, I want that to be um, uh, their home as well. Um, I want them comfortable there. And I know Jen wants the same. Um, yeah, but it'll be an adjustment. It'll be adjustment for them to to go to that. I'm sure they're nervous, they're excited, they're I mean, they've said things, but um, yeah, it'll be an adjustment. I hope it yep it goes smoothly. Hopefully, Jen can be in there. Agreed, Arno. Christmas. That's what she wants to create those memories with the kids and start that transition with them. Um, and you you kind of mentioned that the children, you know, have expressed like, oh, I feel comfortable in this space I've always been in. Um, or, you know, their their own bedrooms. That's the home that you're yes, going to be retaining. That's the home that I will be retaining. Okay. Um, 
and you kind of mentioned that, you know, there's a little bit of an adjustment going between the two homes and you do exchanges on Sundays. Do you have any opinions on whether exchanges could be done on a different day to help the, uh, the adjustment or is Sunday still your proposal is the best option for the kids? I, I, I do think Sunday is best. Um, it, it, it gives us, I mean, I, I think there are plus and minuses and, and whatnot to change the day, but Sunday to Sunday is, is would be my choice. Is that what the kids have been used to? That's um, what they're used to yes. at this point. Yes. You know, yes. as much as you can get used to an adjustment. Yeah, it's it's an adjustment, but I think they've handled it about as well, about as the best that they can. I mean, um, I I've been impressed with how they've handled it. I mean, they have their moments. They're they're tired. You can always tell when they've had a good long weekend with them doing their activities they sometimes they come uh sunday night and they're extremely tired and but monday morning they wake up and it's 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 fantastic um i'm gonna turn my attention to the best interest factor the permanence as a family unit of the existing or proposed custodial home or homes um as we go through these proceedings is it your proposal that the joint uh, physical custody week on week off as set forth in the temporary order that that continue as the final yes absolutely. so fair enough the proposed custodial homes would be your home and miss Klusterman's home correct okay. um so i want to talk about the family unit in each of those homes what is the family unit that will be in your home it'll be me and the three kids are you in any romantic relationships or have any other third party or person coming into the home and the children's lives on a regular basis at this time? No, it's, it's oh. my focus is on the kids. And to your knowledge, neither is Ms. Klusterman. I mean, as much as you can. As know. much as you know, yes. Um, so the proposed custodial homes based on your proposal would be, you know, you and the kids, Ms. Klusterman and the kids. Yes. Um, do you think that that's, you know, a permanent situation or at least a stable situation at this point. Yes, I do. I mean, we're not discounting that parents have the right to move forward, but right. as we are right now. Right, right. Um, my, my focus is on the kids. Um, Ms. Klusterman discussed in her testimony some dogs and a cat that she felt served as um, factual basis for a permanent, stable family unit for the children as favoring her home. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, I do. Um, so tell me about these family pets when you and Ms. Klusterman shared a home together as a family unit with your three children. Uh, we had uh, Copper the cat. We've had him for a number of years and that was the only only pet we had. At one time, we, we had a dog for a short time uh, years ago, um, but our lifestyle, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's like having another child, and it, at, the, at the time, it didn't work. Um, so the the cat that was the it was you, Miss Klusterman, three children, and a cat um, when you were married. Yes. And and have you agreed that Miss Klusterman can keep the cat, the pet? Uh, I, I I was told by her and the kids that they were keeping the cat, which which is fine. Um, so you weren't really asked your opinion on that. No, I was not. I was not. Would you be willing to give the cat a home in the marital home where you return if, if that were offered to yeah, you? If that were offered to me, I would absolutely keep copper. Um, and now these dogs, she mentioned she has two dogs as forming the family unit um, and favoring her home as a proposed custodial home. Do you know anything about these dogs? Uh, the kids say very little. Um, I was uh, served my PPO on July 2nd. That's a Sunday. The very next Friday is when they got the dogs. There's two dogs. Yes. Uh, so these were brought into the home after you moved out. Correct. They, these dogs were not part of the family unit. No. Um, what are your concerns about these dogs? Um. I mean, I think it's it's a lot um, to take care of three kids, two dogs. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's a lot. I don't think it fits our lifestyle. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, 
I think it's 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 fine. The kids say very little about the dogs. Um, I, I think I mean I think it could be good for them. Um, my concern is um, since mediation when it, I when it was decided I would buy the home, Jen has not mowed the lawn or done anything, and I I don't know what if that's out of anger or what. But they're also so I've kind of started to mow the lawn. And there is uh, dog poop, I mean, everywhere. And they, I've heard the kids arguing about who's supposed to clean it up, whatnot. That's that's irrelevant. The part of why I was against having dogs over the years was because of that. My lawn, I'm I mean, I'm a lawn guy. It's what I do. I love a perfect lawn. So that that it was a concern. Um, our lifestyle, how busy we are. Um, it is, it's, it's a lot for Jen. It's a lot for, it would have been a lot for Jen. It would have been a lot for me. Um, we like to go away. We travel for the sports. Uh, there was a week in early October that it was my parenting week and it was a Thursday. Um, and, and I picked Callie up from school. She had to stop by Jen's house to try on some clothes. They had to take a picture and approve it with their choir teacher. So oh, she yeah. did that. I sat there as she did all that. She let, I, I, she let the dog out for a little while, but that day I'm under the assumption that Jen leaves for work at seven 15 in the morning. Um, so Callie let the dog out at like three dogs out at three. Jen came home for a short time and then she went to Bay city for Kelvin's football game. Uh, I know what time she got back because I was at the high school waiting for the bus return to pick up Calvin. It was it was about midnight, maybe a little after. So those dogs were in their crate from 7.15 all the way till midnight and maybe we're out half hour at most. That's abuse. In my world, that's abuse. Well, with respect to the children and the family unit um, and, and Ms. Kusterman's proposal that, that the family pets that she acquired after separation create the family unit, is it fair to say that per your observation is of that example, the kids aren't even in the home with the dog or dogs? Yeah. I should say. Yeah. They're, they're, they're busy doing their sports. They're busy. School. They're busy doing their own thing. Yes. Um, and would you agree then based on that timeline that the presence of the two dogs were a change or an inconsistency as it related to the family unit as it existed during the marriage? Correct. Um, Do you think, in your opinion, the presence of two dogs that were recently acquired should weigh in Miss Boosterman's favor as being a better home for your children primarily versus being with their dad? No, that doesn't play a role at all. Huh. Um, you didn't say the cat jumped on his wiener, did you? They were excited, right? Uh, actually, they never said anything to me about it. Really? How did you learn about these dogs? Uh, they the kids were posting stuff on Snapchat or whatever they use, or but they never said anything to me. Okay, so these dogs showed up around July, June, July. July, yeah. Okay, and as far as you guys have been following the week on week off ever since then. No problems with the kids adjusting to your home without the pets. No, no, they, no, they, they honestly never say anything about them. It's kind of, it's kind of strange, actually. Um, so I want to turn to the next best interest factor: the moral fitness of the parties involved. Are there any concerns about, in your opinion, about your moral fitness with respect to your ability to provide a home and custody for your children? No, not, not at all. Do you have any concerns or observations? about Ms. Klusterman's moral fitness to provide appropriate care and custody for the for your children? I mean, I have a little concern, but I hope in, in the end, I hope it all will be fine. I think it'll be fine. Um, what kind of concern do you have? Um, Jen just has a different style of parenting. I, feel like sometimes she tries to be their friend more than their parent. Um, Jen is, I don't, 
Jen is awful with money, awful. And um, I, I do, I do have concern that she can take care of herself, handle things, and provide for the kids. But well, I, I am talking about moral fitness, so morality. Yeah, and, and I know that's a very generalized term and very subjective to people. But um, do you have some any concerns at all about her her interactions with oh, children here we go. under that sort of? I gotta hear this. Um, I, I think I think Jen has some issues with lying, manufacturing things. Um, I think that's always been a little bit of a concern. I, I hope when this is all over with that that stops. Um, I think there's times that the kids are being included in adult things that shouldn't they shouldn't be included in. I, again, I hope that doesn't continue at the transition. Um, during the course of this divorce matter. Has Ms. Klusterman made accusations against you that you felt were untrue? Yes, absolutely. Um, Thank you. She filed a PPO against you. Yes. By agreement, she ended up withdrawing it. Correct. We heard from the CPS investigator the allegations that were made. Um, did you also come to learn that she made a report to the police about you? Yeah became aware of that the day I was in your office with you and talking to the state police and CPS. And those allegations went nowhere. Correct. Um, do you have any concerns that we get here for this hearing today and there's allegations of abuse that were never brought up prior in this case when she asked for exclusive use of the home she didn't get that, then the PPO came up. Her trial brief didn't talk about the abuse she alleged in her testimony. Where does that fit in with your concerns about her morality and the influence on the children? Um, I think Jen is uh, willing to do whatever it takes to get her way. Um, uh, she I mean, it, it just continues from one thing to the next. When she doesn't get her way, it just seems like she comes up with something else. I think she is out to ruin me in any way, in every way. Um, I, I, I think Jen struggles with the idea of not having the kids 100% of the time. I think Jen is for Jen, and Jen wants the kids because it would be better for her, not the kids. Um, I mean, fair enough. Do you struggle with not seeing your kids every day? Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so this isn't this isn't ideal. I, of course, I'd want to see them every day, and I understand why Jen thinks that. But I'm. But as we sit here today, it's what's your opinion on what you're asking for as far as the kids seeing each parent? I mean, this is the reality is you're separating, right? Right, we're separating and Jen deserves a relationship with them. I deserve a relationship with them. The kids deserve that. Um, you, we have to make the best of this situation. And when you talked about that, you you believe that Ms. Kusterman would do anything to get what she wants, which is the kids every day. Um, gave some examples. Is there a specific example of a time that you were in the home for a couple weeks in June um, regarding the recordings that Ms. Klusterman was making? Yeah, I uh, remember a time uh, I, I happened to be watching TV in, in Jen and I's bedroom. And I forget why I, I, I was leaving the room and I was walking down the hallway and I start hearing Jen talking and she was in the kitchen and she said, Kevin, stop. Kevin, don't touch me. Um, it, it's something to those words. And I, I wasn't even near her. And, and Kelvin was in the room. He heard it. He said, Mom, Dad's you not can't here. Say what, sorry, sorry. sorry, you can't say um, what Kelvin he, I was not near Jen. Um, and she was making, she was recording a video. Um, anytime I was in the home, she was recording. Um, but on that particular occasion, she made it that up. I was not even near her. Nowhere near her. Did 
did Ms. Klusterman make statements to you in April and May as you were beginning to navigate the idea of separation that she still loved you, the children loved you, that you should be with the children that they wanted to be with you? Yes, she did. Okay, those were her statements in April and May. Correct. And was that different than her testimony on, on October 17th? Yes, it was. How so? Uh, her story completely changed because she feels the kids should be with her. She wants the kids 26 days out of a month. And that's the only person that's good for it, Jen. Um, so she changed her tune as we went through this process. Yes. Did she ever tell you, to your knowledge, prior to this divorce, um, that she thought you were abusing your children? No, never. And in fact, in April, May, she was saying, you love your children. She knows you love your children. They love you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And as this proceeded, different things were coming to light. Yes. Again, she's going to do what she feels she needs to do to get her way. Has that been a theme in your marriage? Yes. How so? Just in general or a couple quick examples. Um. I mean, like, we could talk about spring break. If I say no, we uh, can't afford it this year. She kind of just keeps keeps at it, keeps at it till I give in. Um, and, and not that I'm the final say, but I, we make we always made decisions together. But um, if I didn't feel like we could afford it financially, I mean, I, I said that. Um, there would be times where Jen wanted something. I mean, uh, uh, would want something that I didn't agree with. She would try to get her way, even when if it was sex, sexual or whatever, um, which was all just in play with us. But um, she was going to do whatever she could to get her way. Was there, um, they may be jumping ahead, but was there an incident last Christmas that occurred that you felt was her? getting her way or doing something to get her way yes uh christmas eve morning um, i had been out uh, buying salt if i remember right i i plow and there was a storm coming and the snow on christmas and i was doing the things to get prepared for that um last year was lead them if they let you financially a lot for us but, uh, the sports and all that. Jen's Jen's a gift giver. She she would agree with that, and that that's fantastic. But when you don't have the money, you can, you just can't do it. Um, and we were spending so much money on sports, and she didn't feel like we had enough gifts or her or for the kids for Christmas. And she wanted more money, and I said we just we just can't do it. And she got mad, and um, we were in the kitchen, and she actually punched me. Um, and right afterwards, she was like, "I was just trying to knock your hat off your head," but she flat out punched me out of anger because I was saying no to giving her more money. So when I said no to her, I don't know how she did it with Venmo, but she got whether it was 300 or 400 dollars she got it from her parents so not only did i get punched she got what she wanted and then we had to pay her parents back that money um and they, she was gonna she felt we needed more gifts for the kids that's her love language um it, it, that's always been her thing whether you have the money or not she was going to find a way to make it happen so it was your opinion that you guys really couldn't afford the addition. It wasn't the issue of no gifts. It was just more. Yeah, it's 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 about the numbers. It, she she loves tons of gifts. She loves Christmas. The kids love Christmas. But yes, uh, Jen wanted more gifts for the kids. And you ultimately, despite it not being your opinion that you could afford it, you ultimately had to pay because you had paid for parents back is that what i heard in your testimony yeah I, I mean it's been a while but and a lot has happened so it's 
hard to remember that stuff. But yes, I'm. As far as I know, I remember Jen telling me that she, she needed to pay her parents back that money, and we and we did. Um, <clears throat> turning to the mental and physical health of all parties involved, do you have any mental or physical health concerns that would prevent you from the ability to properly provide care for your children? No, absolutely not. Um, and. Do you know if Ms. Klusterman has any mental or physical health concerns that prevent her from properly providing care for the children? No. Okay. Um, nobody has a, any diagnosis from any doctors or mental health professionals of any kind? No, nothing. And the children don't have any mental or physical health concerns either? No, nothing. Um, the homeschool and community record of the children, uh, do any of your children have any community record issues like juvenile delinquency, um, anything like that? No. No. What about their school records? How are they? Uh, kids do great in school. Um, they're very driven in the classroom. Um, they do miss some for sports and whatnot. I mean, that may, they always are uh, eager to get caught up on that. Um, but school is a focus. If they don't have A's, um, it, it bothers them. One of uh, Callie right now has A's and uh, I think the last I saw it was a, a B. And I, as soon as that email comes from the school, I always say great job and and whatnot. And, and her response is always something about the B. She's concerned about that B, not, not the A. She's not excited about the A, she's concerned about the B. And Kelvin's the same way. And Callie, or Kelsey has come so far and doing well, um, but school's a focus. So, and I, I pushed to, for them to do that, and to do well. <clears throat> No major disciplinary issues like being expelled or anything like that. No. Um, and we already talked quite a bit about school. Um, your younger daughter needed some extra help, but yes. she's but she's doing well now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and all your all your children are you know good students and yeah, yeah. behave properly in school. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ms. Glusterman uh, had discussed that your son was disciplined in school for. Um, I guess swinging his lanyard and hitting a female student on the bottom. Do you recall her testimony about that? I do. She testified that you wanted nothing to do with meeting with the principal. Do you recall her testifying to that? Yes, time? I do. Um, was your son expelled or given detention or any kind of punishment for that incident? He was suspended for one day. Okay. Um, and did you not want to participate in that meeting? Was her testimony correct? It was not the school did not want to meet with us. Jen reached out to them. I thought, I mean, I, I, I didn't necessarily think it was necessary to see. All she wanted to do was see the video. If, um, it wasn't that I didn't want to see it. If she wanted to see it, great. I took their word for it. I, I know Calvin was bothered by it. I, I think it was justified for him to be suspended. He needs to be careful about it. I mean, he said it was an accident, which I believe. I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but he needed to be more careful in that world and uh, not make sure he's not doing things like that. So I thought it was justified. But if Jen wanted to see the video, I, I didn't think, I mean, Jen and I were always like, we team up on everything. I, if she went and saw it, and of course I'm in communication with what she saw and how, but I did I feel like I needed to be there with her to see it? No. Um, did you, but that didn't mean I care any less than Jen does. Did you deny a request by the school to meet with parents? No. So are you saying that this meeting wasn't Jen, really- Jen requested. <laughs> to your knowledge, was it communicated to you that this was a meeting for the school and the parents or you talked about seeing a video. Uh, Jen just wanted to meet with them so she could see that they said they had a video and showed Calvin did it. She wanted to see it. I believed them. I thought it was justified to have him suspended. He needs to be punished if he does something wrong. Okay. He learned his lesson. Was that an isolated incident? That was very isolated. Oh. But again, it's not like I deny, I didn't want to, I mean, I felt like it. Jen could see it and communicate with me. Jen, yeah, Jen's the teacher. This is her world. I'm going to take, I'm going to follow her. And I, Were you, were you trying to convey that you were uninvolved or didn't care about your children? No, I, I, I'm very involved. Uh, 
any time that a parent or a principal or somebody from the school like specifically reached out and said, hey, I want to talk to parents about something going on with the kids. Have you been there? Yeah, or, or with, uh, with Jen and getting the information from Jen. It's not like I don't know what's going on like Jen wants to see it because she knows that's not true. Um, and we've already talked quite a bit about how managing three kids can be complicated, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. So sometimes you guys had to divide and conquer. Absolutely. Um, That's how we did most things. Um, in that circumstance with Calvin, did you talk to him about his behavior? Of course. Um, so just summary, there's really nothing as far as homeschool community record that's of note specifically for the children. No. no. You don't believe so? No. Um, Turning to the reasonable preference of the child, um, if the court considers the child to be of sufficient age to express a preference, this is always difficult for parents of children that are children your age, 10, 13, 15, they talk to you about stuff. We can't talk about what the kids have told you. Right. Um, but I do want to know, and I, and I, what your opinion is to the court, um, if your children, in your opinion, are old enough and mature enough to state a reasonable preference as to their custodial arrangements if they were asked? Yes. Okay. Um, do you believe that they would state such an or express such a preference truthfully and openly during an in-camera interview? Absolutely. Okay. Um, do you have any concerns at all that Ms. Klusterman um, or a member of her family or her father had had been attempting to influence the children's preference during the course of this um this case yeah i think they have um was there an issue with a boat that was talked about yeah a couple of different boats a fishing boat um uh whether the boat was bought or he had it it showed up and i felt like they were trying to influence what the kids wanted uh and the dogs. And dogs. Uh, there was talk of uh, a ski boat. There was talk of snowmobiles. Um, it's it's one thing to support the kids. I felt like this went beyond that to uh, buy the kids. Uh, so snowmobiling, boating, that's kind of always been something you have done with the kids. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, obviously, Jim has two mm -hmm. um but jen's parents had a, a pontoon boat that's 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 great for them and then all of a sudden the talk became of let's get a ski boat and the ski boat is what um my parents have or my cousin and his wife have so it's kind of like our side has had this the ski boat um, um and then all of a sudden there was talk of that family getting one and trying to motivate. It's, it's appeared that they were trying to motivate the kids to want to be somewhere other than with me. Um, I want to turn to the next best interest factor, the willingness and ability of each of the parents to facilitate and encourage a close and continuing parent-child relationship between the child and the other parent. Um, do you believe you are willing and able to facilitate and encourage a close and continuing relationship with the children and Ms. Klusterman? Absolutely. How do you feel that you do this? Um, I, I say things to the kids to promote that and, and, and say that it's important to have a relationship with their mother, or with me. I hope, I hope Jen, I, I know Jen thinks, thinks that. She's not saying that now because she's trying to get something else but um, um I, I i absolutely want them to have a relationship with jen a great relationship with jen um jen deserves that the kids deserve that um i uh i, I promote that with the kids um your kids are preteen teenage years right yes do they sometimes come to you with relationship issues, whether it's their friends, their parents, their grandparents, their classmates? Uh, yes. 
have they ever come to you generally about, you know, their relationship issues with their mom? Yes. And how do you encourage and support and facilitate that relationship if they're expressing a concern? Um, I uh, tell them to communicate well with her, to listen to her. Um, Calvin is one that could be, he gets angry. Um, I know those two can butt heads at times. I tell him to remain calm. Mom wants what's best for him. Um, it, it, I, I, I want him to have the best relationship in the world with her. But so even if they butt heads, do you take the opportunity to be like, oh, mom's terrible? Or no, I, do you do you suggest that he needs to listen to his mom when he's with her and, and you support her parenting decisions? I support her parenting decisions. And yes, I, I have listened to those conversations. I had those conversations with him. Um, and uh, I, I tell him to, he needs to do what she says, um, that she wants what's best for him. I, I, I never say bad things about her. If things are said that I didn't say, I stop that and uh, make sure we're talking positive and, and things like that. Um, do you have a lot of communication or a little communication with Ms. Kusterman about the kids? Um, as far as, you know, they need these things or this this issue is going on with one of the kids. Yeah, I, I feel like we communicate a lot. How often do you communicate with Miss Kusterman, just on average? Uh, I mean, it's it's most days. Most days. And there's times where it's more, there's times where it's not as much. I mean, are, and, and do you discuss not just topics of, Okay, we the logistics, we got to get this kid here or there, but do you discuss other parenting things, like our son is making this decision, and this is what I'm telling him to do, and, you know, yes. how does that go? Uh, most of the time, well, um, there are other times that it hasn't gone well. Our youngest, uh, for example, has a phone. I feel like she's young for the phone, uh, too young for a phone. I think it's unnecessary. Um, Jen did that anyway, went and did it anyway. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's worked out okay. My concern with the phone with all three kids is they are becoming addicted to these things and it's created fights, unnecessary fights, um, or arguments, not fighting, but arguing. Um, because I mean, every kid is doing it and it's, it's, a uh, it's an issue. So Jen and I communicate about that. Um, but I, I didn't have a say in that one. Otherwise I would have said, or I did say no. Um, um, but that's, that's, that's been an issue. Callie's great with her phone. You tell her to put it away. She does. Sometimes she doesn't even know where it is. That's, she's not obsessed with things. Kelvin and Kelsey, uh, it's, it's definitely an issue. Um, Jen has even stated that with Kelvin's phone, I don't want any restrictions, and that's that's just flat out false. I'm, I want I want more restrictions. Where Jen has talked about me not wanting restrictions is is a certain time time frame. I feel there's a video game that he and his friends play, and he communicates through his phone, talking to them as they play this game online. And I'm fine with the talking, but I want the social media stuff locked down. I I don't want that going on at all hours of the day. Um, it's gotten to the point where I actually take their phones at night. Um, and Kelsey's phone, she's on Snapchat. I think there's TikTok. That phone vibrates at all hours of the night. And and Jen is under Jen is in control of these lockdowns with this phone. These phones. I brought that to her attention. She agreed that something needed to be done. Um, Kelsey, you can look at the phone. There was one time I looked at the phone and it, she was on that thing about four hours a day. Um, and and, and I've, I've take, taken the phones at night to make sure that they are on them at night. Um, but it's an issue, but that that's one thing that we 
communicate a lot about, or maybe maybe argue about. Um, but for the most part, we communicate well about the kids. Uh, but it's quite it's and and kind of focusing on this, um, encouraging and facilitating the relationship. And we're talking about you supporting that relationship that the kids have with Miss Klusterman right now. We'll switch gears in a second. Um, has Miss Klusterman come to you and said, "Hey, this and this is going on with our child. This is my." take on parenting um have you supported you know if the child is have there been any instances where the child's you know upset about her decision how do you handle that um i i always tell them that jen wants the best for them she she's always going to put them first in, in in her decision making on things that they are doing uh, i promote that again i, I I want her to have an amazing relationship with them, as I think she, deep down, wants that with me. Um, do you feel that Miss Klusterman has exhibited um, a willingness and an ability to facilitate and encourage a close and continuing relationship with you and the children throughout these proceedings? I think what Jen has wanted has changed um, early on. Like you said, she said the kids needed to be in my life now she wants me to have them four days a month um was there was there an incident where you were in attendance at a game for one of your children in the last couple months with your mother um that that something occurred between jen and your mother yeah my mom was uh, sitting by somebody that Jen is not a fan of, and I happen to be leaning on the fence, just uh, watching the watching the game. And uh, Jen coached the team, uh, and she approached me because she saw my mom sitting by that person, and she said, uh, "You and your mom can go f yourselves." Uh, she didn't say f; she said the actual word. Um, and there were there were there were kids around. There were people that heard. Um, completely unnecessary, inappropriate. Um, it made, I went and made my mom aware of that and my mom actually left um, and went home. She was uh, so upset. Um, when this occurred, were any of your children present at that event? Yeah, Callie, it's, it was Callie's softball team and, and her teammates. And were her teammates with an earshot or her with an earshot of Ms. Klusterman making this statement to you? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I don't know if they did hear that no one reacted. I didn't look around to see if anybody reacted, but yeah, they were definitely, they were definitely close enough to hear. Um, any other incidents like that that have occurred recently? Um, spring break a couple of years ago, we were in Florida with my cousin, his wife, and their two kids. We had rented a house with them. Um, the house had a pool, pool table. It was a huge place for all of us. Um, and it was just a, a place that we hung out for the whole week. Uh, kids could swim and do whatever they wanted. We were on a canal fishing. And at one point, one of the evenings, um, and, and we were uh, hanging out. The kids were playing pool, and I was playing pool with uh, my cousin's wife. And Jen uh, kind of had just kind of been after me the whole week. Um, my cousin even stated that when he testified that he, she made it uncomfortable. Um, well, we were playing pool, and Jen was upset that I was playing pool with her. And she came in and all five kids from the age of maybe be, maybe six, seven to Calvin was probably 13, 14 at the time. And in front of all five kids, she comes in and she says, why don't, why don't you two just go F, she said. Again, she didn't use F, she used the real world word. We all know that you want to. And the kids were all in that room. They all heard it. Um, it it created a, an issue. Um, I was made aware that they, that family will never go on vacation with us 
being Jen and I again um, because of that. Um, Jen lost her cool, got angry, said something that she shouldn't have, but she did. Are those two incidents that you testified to, or is that the only time that she's said anything disparaging about you in front of the kids? Um, I mean, nothing stands out. Has it happened before at other occasions? Yeah. I mean, and why does that give you concern of her, if she's doing that to she your is face? slowly waking do up. Do you have any concerns about her willingness and ability to facilitate that close and continuing relationship with your children and you now that you're separated? Um, I think right now it's very much an issue. My hope is that as this situation comes to conclusion, as we both can move on with our lives, that that stuff can stop, that stuff will stop, um, that we can get in a routine. I think Jen is a very angry human being right now. Um, oh. I, 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 my, my hope is that that stuff stops. I mean, it's a huge transition for all five of us. Um, and as, a, as, as we move away from this and move on, I, I, I hope that that stuff stops. Um, oh yeah. When it comes to you and Ms. Kusterman discussing parenting decisions for your children, if you express, you know, that there was a disciplinary issue or that your child came to you about something or that you want something to occur with respect to parenting, how does she respond to you? Um, I feel like she, she listens for the most part. Um, I mean, the phones have been an issue. I've asked for those to be locked down, especially more on Kelvin and Kelsey. Um, I feel like for the most part, I, right again, right now, I feel like there's a lot of games being played to try to make me look bad. Uh, my, my goal is that crap stops after this is over with and that we can actually work together. There are times that in the last couple months that I feel like, well, things are going great. We are working together and then something happens and then something stupid happens and then all of a sudden I feel like we're fighting again and can't get along and but when I think it comes down to the kids I, I do feel like for the most part we agree on what have what needs to be done um but I, I'm tired of the games I'm ready for the games to be over with I'm tired of it I'm ready for all of this to be done and move on so that Jan and the kids can live their life, and the kids and I can live our life. But I, I want the best for the kids. The focus is on the kids. Um, turning to domestic violence and whether or not there was violence directed um, at a child or witnessed by a child or not directed or witnessed by a child, but just in the home between you and Miss Boosterman, all of that. Has there been domestic violence between you and Miss Boosterman? Well, she punched me on Christmas Eve, and then in 2019, we had an argument where we were hand, we were hand fighting. She was on the couch. I was kneeling next to the couch, and, and we were kind of hand fighting, and I shoved her hands away from mine, and my, I don't know if it was her hand or my hand, got her in the nose. She had a nose ring that made her nose bleed, and she called the police on me. Um. When we went to look for the criminal record, it didn't exist. Is that correct? Right. Why is that? Because uh, I was told if I just went through the classes and everything that I needed to do, it would go away. So you don't actually have a criminal record? No. Um, she's alleged in these proceedings that you do. Right. Is that true? Well, it's true that she says that. Well, is it true that yeah, you have no, a criminal it's not, record? No, it's not true. And you talked about the, the the Christmas Eve incident where she punched you. Was that 2022? Yes. Were the children in the home when that happened? Yes. Did the children were the children in the room? No. Okay. Um. Did you call the police when that happened? I did not. Why not? Because uh, 
I knew, I knew. Oh, but I had gone through in 2019 what the kids went through as far as that, even Jen, and there was no way I was going to have the kid's mother arrested on Christmas Eve. I, I, I don't. I didn't want Jen to go through that. I don't want the kids to go through that. Um, I believe him, but stop crying. I mean, Jen has showed anger towards me. I I didn't think she she lost her cool. I don't think she intended to hit me. Um, and I didn't want her to go through what I went through. Yeah, a, I didn't want her family to go through that. Was that the only time she ever did that? No. Are there other times? I mean, there's times she tried to hit me, corner me, bite me. Um, Have you, ever seen, have you ever seen her behave like that towards the children? No, I mean, she'll get angry, but she would never touch her children. What about the cornering you, attempting to bite you, things like that? Did that happen in front of the children or with the uh, children in the home? The children are in the home. I don't, I don't believe that they ever saw. Um, most of the time when Jen would corner me, we'd, we'd, we'd have a disagreement, argument. I would uh, walk away to try to cool the situation. Um, that situation, we were in our old home. We had a walk-in closet. Uh, I would I would happen to be in the closet. Jen came in and cornered me. And when I tried to get by her, that she tried to bite me, grab me, punch me, and I, I grabbed I her hand to stop her from doing those things and keep her at a distance. Um, I would like to direct your attention to the previously admitted exhibit, um, plaintiff's exhibit 49. And I will, do we need to share screen or do we all have that? I have it, thank you. Your Honor? I'm good, thanks. Okay. Um, I am going to pull it up for my client, however, so one moment. Um, sir, do you remember that Ms. Klusterman testified to, and this Exhibit 49 was admitted um, as a picture of her arm with a bruise? Mm -hmm. Do you recall uh, an incident in 2018, I think, believe she testified October 2018, um, where she had a bruise on her arm that do you remember? I mean, I, I, I recall the, this, I didn't see the picture at the time. I don't remember the bruise, but I know the only time I grabbed her was when she was trying to bite me or hit me. Um, in October of 2018, when she testified, she had this bruise. What was going on between you and her? I mean, I, I obviously a disagreement. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't recall the exact. I mean, that's a long time ago. Um, was that the incident where she was trying to bite you? Yes, yes. I was keep trying to keep her hand away from me. Did you intend to hurt her? No. Were, no. were you acting, so to speak, in self-defense, in your opinion? Absolutely. Where was she trying to bite you? In my hand or anywhere she could get me. Um, I just was trying to keep her hand away from me, pinch me, grab me, hit me. I and just, was she doing this aggressively, not not a playful tickling, oh, it pinching? Was, no, it was not playful. Okay. Were you, you were disagreeing about something? Yeah. Was she coming at you aggressively? Yes. Were you approaching her aggressively? No. Um, Let's move on to exhibit 46. Pull that up for you. Previously admitted exhibit, plaintiff's exhibit 46. Um, Ms. Klusterman testified that this is her back with scratches that she received by your hands in February of 2019. Do you recall that testimony in this exhibit? Yes. What was going on in February of 2019 between you and Ms. Klusterman? Uh, argument, disagreement. Um, I can be in an argument 
and walk away and just let it let the situation calm itself. <laughs> Jen does not like to do it that way. She likes to resolve it right away. Um, that's just her style. If I'm walking away from her, she's trying to corner me. That mark on her back came from a light switch that was in one of our hallways. I just needed some time to cool the situation. She was trying to corner me. I tried to get around her, like, you know, I mean, a hallway is not very wide. I tried to move her to the right. She tripped, hit her back on a light switch. We had been doing some painting, if I remember right, so there's no light switch cover. I think it was, so it made it a little larger. She nailed her back on that. It was not that I shoved her or anything. I tried to get by her to get my space, calm the situation, get away um, to let things cool before we continued. And she, Jen's not one to like, she likes to resolve things right away. And um, As far as physically, was she approaching you aggressively or getting in your way from leaving? Yes. How, how like, kind of explain like what all happened she, she likes to try to corner me into a bedroom or, or into a room, into a space to resolve the situation. And sometimes I just need a few minutes to calm. Um, and when I tried to get by her, that, that's, that's what happened. I just, I just need my space for a few minutes uh, did, just to collect my thoughts and let her calm down. Did you aggressively push her into the wall? No. Even trying to get by her, like elbow or anything like that, what... What happened that she got the scratch on her back? I mean, I moved her aside, and obviously she's pushing back and, and whatnot. But what do I you did, mean moved her aside? Did you? Well, with my arm moved. Did I, did I push her, shove her? No, I just tried to squeeze. I mean, we're in a hallway. I tried to squeeze by. At no point did I shove her or anything like that. I mean. Um, had she been not? trying to corner you, would any of this happen? No, it wouldn't have happened. I want to direct your attention to Exhibit 47. It's a picture that Ms. Klusterman testified is of your son Calvin's arm, per her testimony with fingerprints in either 2018 or 19. Do you recall seeing that exhibit? I recall seeing the exhibit, yes. Have you ever seen this picture of your son, Calvin, before? No. In 2018, 19, that was four or five years ago, five, right. six years ago, maybe. Right. Um, she never showed you this picture before? No, I don't recall ever seeing that picture. You ever see Calvin in 2018 or 19 with three lines on his arm? No. Um, did you ever grab your son Calvin's arm and leave fingerprints on it. No. Um, even looking at this picture, do those appear to be fingerprint marks in your opinion? I mean, given the size of your hand and um, your yeah. son's size. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, it doesn't appear like it, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't abuse my kids or touch my kids in that way. Um, how old was Calvin in 2018 or 19? Or no, uh, nine, ten, somewhere in there. Uh, so he would have physically been smaller than he is today, correct? Oh, absolutely, yes. And um, again, Miss Klusterman never in five or six years said, hey, I think I have it of our son. No, not, not physically, no. Have you ever aggressively physically laid hands on any of your children? No. Oh. My kids are my world. I, I I don't want to hurt them. Do you have any concern that Ms. Kusterman is taking pictures like this and five or six years later is when she says she's got a concern, not when it happened? Um, it's very odd. It's, it's very odd. Does your son Calvin um, now or even when he was nine, ten years old or any other time, did he ever get bruises or marks on him just from being a kid and playing of course how often uh, quite often he's a very uh physical 
active, athletic young man. So, uh, they would have it quite often. So what is it unusual that he would have marks on him from playing with other kids or no, playing sports? No, not at all. I, I, I would not. I would not physically hurt my children. At, at nine or 10 years old, was he already in contact sports with other children? I, yes. I was wondering um, that myself. I don't know. Do you have any reason to believe that this injury was sustained in a different way than you, such as sports with kids or gym Absolutely. or school? Absolutely. Or, Absolutely. And Ms. Klusterman never brought this to your attention in 2018 or 19? No. Not a single time? Not a single time. Um, let's turn your attention to exhibit 54 that was previously admitted here. Um, Ms. Klusterman presented this exhibit from 2015. Um, how many years ago was 2015? Uh, eight years. Eight years ago. Eight years ago. Um, she claimed that she sent you a text that your son Calvin had a fever. How old was Calvin in 2015? Uh, seven. Seven, seven eight years He's old. He's 15 now. Correct. Okay. Um, so tell me about this text message exchange because her testimony was that this is relevant to your current parenting of your children now in 2023. What was the context of this discussion where she stated, Calvin is burning up, I should sleep with him tonight, and your response, I can do whatever you want after you deep throat me? Um, it's a stupid text. Um, it's goofing off. It's a sense of humor. Um, that's like the type of relationship Jen and I had. We'd laugh about that stuff. Um, I'd make light of the situation. I mean, what? I mean, I, I felt like sometimes Jen would overreact with like, you know, what she needs to do with the kid or a situation. Like the kids get sick. Um, um, but I didn't. I mean, that was a, that was it was a joke. Um, I mean, I just like was making light of the situation. As part of, stuff. As part of your marital relationship, did you joke about things like that? I mean, you're adults in a in a relationship, right? Yeah, it was yeah, it happened often. It was all what? it was play, it was fun. It was in in the goofing around. I mean that maybe it's yeah, yeah, it's it's weird. It's a, maybe a strange sense of humor, but it's, it's it was funny. It was it was always funny and with Jen until it wasn't, until she decided that was something she could try to use against me. In 2015, was this type, the type of banter that you and her had? Absolutely. Um, I, I, he's credible to me here. In the incidents where your son was sick, were you both in the home while this text message exchange was occurring? Yes. Were you also talking outside of text messaging yeah. about your son's care? Yeah. Did you do anything to prevent her from providing proper care for your child while he was ill? No, not at all. Were you participating in the care for your child while he was ill? Yeah, I do what is needed. And these text messages, were they at that time in 2015, were they private between, <clears throat> excuse me, a husband and a wife? Yes. Okay. Did yeah, well, you... I, would, I would never, we would never, we, Jen or I would never talk like that in front of each other. It okay. was all just text messages play. And at the time of yeah, I mean, this doesn't shock me. Being ill on this occasion, was he provided proper care and attention? Absolutely, kids come first in everything Jen does and everything I do. Um, the test messages kind of go on into the next couple days, and she presented um, this entire exchange. What else are you seeing going on in the day after this and the following day as between as it relates to parenting? I mean, everything that needs to be done as far as a parent for their child goes on. And, um, 
you know, we carry on multiple conversations in the same, <laughs> I guess they call it text thread or, or whatever. Um, yeah, can you get milk from the store? Sure, no problem. Yeah. And, you know, I'll be home when I'll be home. Yeah. But is, is the balance of this an accurate representation of this type of relationship that you had in maintaining a household and caring for kids? Yeah. So, yeah. so that one comment up there, insensitive maybe, but yeah, I mean, taken out of context. Not, not the proudest moment, but yes, it's uh, taken out of context. It was all in, in fun, and Jim knows that. How did she respond to you in person when you said that? She would laugh. Or... I mean, Stan, you get Simp of the Day award. Or whatever, a goofy look, or I mean, laugh. Congratulations. Off. She knew not to take me too serious. Did you actually intend to convey to her on this occasion or any other occasion that you were not going to parent your children or take care of the responsibilities of the household until there was some sexual favor provided? No, no. Kids always came first. <laughs> How do you explain that her testimony now is that that was ongoing fear in her mind that if she didn't perform sexually for you, you wouldn't take care of the kids or the household or your obligations as a parent and husband? I, I think Jen has known for a long time that our marriage has struggled. Um, We've had our we've had a lot of ups and downs. Um, I think she I think she is doing whatever she can to get her way. Um, she was not in danger. She never felt in danger. I I think she kept some of this stuff in case she ever felt like she needed to use it against me. Why would she need to use it against you? To get her way. It's a it's a game. Oh. Throughout your marriage, did Miss Klusterman ever once tell you, I don't consent to this sex talk or texting? No, I mean, she, she made offers to me. It was just as much her offering me in a game it was, as it was to her. I don't keep my text messages if I... Had all my text messages from the last 10 years. I'm sure there's stuff that she said to me. During your marriage, did she ever tell you, you know, I don't want to do something sexually. I don't consent to this. And then you forced her to do it? No, never. Never. Um, during your marriage, did she ever tell you after the fact that she did something sexually with you and that she really didn't want to, but she did it because she was threatened or intimidated by you? No. Did, no. she, did she tell you to stop those text messages? No, no, she knew it was all in fun. And, and, play. and were those text messages like, I mean, was that all day, every day that you were saying stuff like that? Or No. Okay. Um, any other indication to you by, even if it was not verbal, but physical or some other cues that, you know, your, relationship, your marital relationship with Ms. Kusterman was no longer wanted. Anything like that going on in the years? Um, I mean, you know, we had our ups and downs, but I think we both always wanted to make it work. Um, even kind of as you were navigating the separation process last February, March, April, May, June, you know, as we were kind of in and out of the home and uh, this divorce proceeding was starting, was Miss Klusterman still on occasion giving you what you believed were cues or advances sexually that, that you know, she was flirting with you? Absolutely. And then she would flip <laughs> a switch and go the other way. Yeah. I mean, the, during the, even during that time, I was in the home. Um, I mean, generally, I knew she always had her phone on her. Did you get that? What? <laughs> oh, sorry. That's my watch. Um, I will take it watch off. Um, I mean, I remember one instance where I came home from working. 
she actually patted me down to make sure I didn't have my phone on me. And then she talked to me, you know, sexually uh, or, you know, in, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sexually and, and things made offers. And I think she knew I would follow up on that and uh, kind of push that. And she, she did, she used it against me. We've seen some of that in this. This is not, but, yeah, she, she made sure that I wasn't recording her before she did it. This is not inconsistent um, with her testimony. No, it was back and forth. <laughs> is there other examples? I mean, she didn't present them, but are there other times where, I mean, in person in text that she flirted with you or made sexual advances on you? Absolutely. It was, so is that, absolutely. did you feel that was just part of that was part of the fact that you're in a romantic marital relationship? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you guys are people and a couple outside of having kids, right? Right. Was any of that exposed to the children ever? No, no, no. We were we did not do stuff in front of the children, we, and we didn't talk like that in front of the children. Um, another example here, Exhibit Fifty Six. I'll pull that up for you to um, review that. Um, Exhibit 56, Ms. Klusterman testified as another example of you responding with, uh, responding to her with wanting sexual contact when she's talking about the children. Do you recall kind of that testimony where she uh, expressed that? Yeah. And so looking at remembering Exhibit 56, said, yeah. yeah. Um, looking at Exhibit 56, uh, 2018, so five, five-ish yeah. years ago, um, almost six now. Um, she's she testified that she was wanting to watch her sister's kids, and you didn't want that to happen. Right. And um, what, what was going on there? Um. I mean, it's it's different than what Jen says. I if I remember right, Jen was uh, Jen always didn't know. I mean, there's an age gap in Jen and her sister. They didn't always see eye to eye. Uh, I mean, they're they're siblings. They're 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 close. But I remember Jen being frustrated with her sister, feeling like she was being taken advantage of. Um, her sister wanted her to take care of her kids, um, and I didn't think she necessarily needed to go out of her way to help her sister out when her sister doesn't necessarily return the favor or, you know, uh, I, I guess if we're always doing stuff for them and they don't do stuff for us, then why, why, why continue that? And I remember Jen being frustrated with her, um, but other than that, no, I would never tell her not to help her sister. It was strictly um, a disagreement between them. And, you know, if, if you feel like you're taken advantage of or upset with her, then, then why go out of your way to help them? Um, but I would never tell her not to take care of her kids just for the sake of telling her not to take care of her kids. Um, and when we kind of look down the page in the text string, all of a sudden there's a comment there from you to her about sexual activity. Yep. Tell me about why you decided to say that at that point in time. Make light of a situation, make a joke, re relax the situation, uh, laugh with Jen. I, I always over the years uh, would try to get Jen to just relax and go with the flow and 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 don't let things bother you so much. And if that was my sense of humor. And again, was that private? That wasn't something, a sense of humor that you shared? With no, yourself, no, right? it was be, that's fine. Yeah, it's okay. some text that was <laughs> between Jen and I. At, but, at the time, did it appear that she took that as a threat or, I mean, did, did she give you that impression that she was threatened by that comment or no, intimidated no, by that comment? No, never. I mean, her response was, uh, no, LOL. What does LOL mean to you when she said that? Laugh out loud. Right. Um, and then 
within seconds, I'm going to sleep downstairs with Calvin. I told him I would. Did you believe she was taking that as a joke? She didn't take it seriously. No, she absolutely took it as a joke. Okay. She didn't respond to that. No, okay. she knew it was just a joke. And then um, going further, you made a, a statement, come in here, I have an offer for you. How did she respond to that? I mean, I don't, that certain one, I, I don't recall, but I mean, laughing it off. She said, I'm on my way oh. within two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was fun. It was, it was us goofing around together. Again, it was, it was fun at the time and it was fun for her. It's what we joked about. We had a very physical relationship. That was. And at the time, did she say to you either in person mm -hmm. or in text, Hey, don't say something like that. I feel scared, intimidated. Go. No, go never. Away. I mean, she might think I was weird weird sense of humor but she never told me not to do it or not that she felt threatened or anything like that it was it was never anything like that and she laughed and absolutely um, i mean maybe she thought i was stupid or an idiot but yeah she laughed so never gave you any indication Agreed. like don't say something like that to me that's rude Just no, no, never, never, never. Um, she played with you absolutely. on that absolutely. banter back and forth absolutely okay. We only have one page of this text message string. There's probably more, right? Yeah. I mean, you guys text a lot. Uh, yeah, it was a lot, yeah. Okay. Let's look I, at exhibit 55. I would think it's weird if you Shut don't say some here. naughty stuff to your spouse. Um, then Be exhibit honest. 55. That would strike me as stranger. She testified that she thought your responses to her were um, an example of inappropriate parenting because of the use of language. Um, do you recall her testimony regarding that? Yes. Um, what was going on in, in 2020, so three, almost four years ago now, um, in this text exchange? Um. Immature. If I remember right, it was a an conversation that involved <laughs> Kelvin at hockey and things he was hearing at hockey. And, um, that was that. Um, she's saying here, I think her example was that her statement was still not worth calling him an ass. Come on, Jason, get it together. Oh, right, what, right. what was going on there that... <laughs> You know, did, did you call your son an ass? Uh, it's possible I told him he was acting like an ass, yeah. <laughs> um, he was misbehaving on that occasion. Yeah. Okay. She took issue with the use of that language in front of the child. Swear words, curse words. Right. Was her testimony. And, and her testimony was that she felt that you didn't take that seriously. Why Why did you respond this way? You, you said, don't ever go around the hockey team. What, what was going on here? Um, he, he was hearing things. I mean, he, hearing that language. Uh, so I, I knew he heard words like that. Um, not, that doesn't justify it, but... Um, have you ever heard another parent swear or use a curse word in front of their child? Uh, yeah, a whole lot. And in hockey locker rooms, do the kids also use that kind of language? I mean, yeah. right, wrong, or indifferent, it happens. Yeah, it happens. Okay. And we've had that conversation with him that we try to not not have those things happen. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, Jen uses that, that language and, and not that we, we both try not to. Sometimes it just comes out. I mean, you previously testified to her using the F word, the F-U-C-K word. Yeah, and I'm sure she regrets that, but it's, it's still- It has happened. happened. It has happened, okay. yeah. Do you take parenting seriously? Very seriously. Do you also acknowledge that you can't protect your children from every influence in exposure to everything ever anywhere as they get older and get more social and involved with other kids and other people yes it, it can be a little overwhelming 
to try to protect them and teach them right from wrong and the language that they use. Um, yeah, I, I, I have that conversation. It, it, the, the girls, not so much Calvin. I mean, he's he's a 15-year-old boy. He's using language that I don't approve of, and I tell him that. I'm sure Jen tells him the same thing. Oh. But were you, I mean, dismissive of Ms. Klusterman's concerns here, or were you, why were you talking to her in this way when she brought this to your attention? Uh, to try to make light of the communication, I guess, uh, to calm the situation, to know that he does hear stuff like that. Is that a recognition of the realities of the world? Yes, yes. Okay, but that's not, were you communicating to her? I, I, I don't take this seriously, I'm being a parent and. No, I take I, parenting very seriously. I want my. I guess, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, you know, her testimony was that you blew her off and didn't take this seriously and why you were responding the way you were responding here. Yeah, no, I take it very seriously. And I, as a parent, I don't want to use that language. I don't want Jen using that language. I don't want my kids using that language. We try to even be in front of people that aren't going to use that language, but it happens. Um, was this a private text exchange between you and Ms. Boosterman as well? Yes. So your comments to Ms. Kusterman were not overheard, seen to your knowledge, I mean, at least from your perspective, by any of the kids. Right. I mean, we do our very best at not talking like that in front of the kids or having them use that language or people that they're in front of using that language. Um, I want to turn your attention to, let's see which exhibit we're on now. Exhibit Honor, I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt council's flow, but we've been going for about three hours. Is it possible we could take a restroom break? Well, we're only going till noon, so. We're only going till noon today? Well, yeah, I thought this was lunch. scheduled all day. <laughs> Until we break for lunch, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> That's when we break. <laughs> yeah, we can take a break. I, I don't know. All right, I'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Oh, good Lord. Do I stick with this thing? I feel bad. This this guy strikes me. I don't know. I'm just going off my gut impressions. I'm not there. He, he strikes me as incredibly credible. That sounds like a lot of marriages. It conforms to my experience. He dirty texts his wife. I think he should be commended for it. I I really do. Her testimony is that she's um handing out favors to get a dog. And then she wants to then she wants to be all puritanical and say he dir dirty texted me. Come on. Come on. I mean that was her testimony. I had it on my channel. That's what she said. I don't. I, I. don't know if I believe her after after some of the stuff that 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 has come out. But maybe, yeah. You know, I. I don't know. I'm not there. I don't know the facts. Nobody does. But uh, thirty texting your own wife. I. I. I you know. I, I. Not only is it not a crime, it should be encouraged. That. That's the way I see it. <laughs> <laughs> is he perfect probably not but i i can tell by the way he's talking i oh and this this uh i'm backing a guy who starts bawling uh t twice during hearing you you know that makes me nuts that that makes me crazy but th th this guy's this guy's trying to be a good dad from what i can tell do, do, is there anybody in here who's, who just thinks that this guy's evil incarnate so far, we're, we're coming up to cross. You, 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 we might find things out. I, my, my opinion might be changed.
I think we just have a marriage that uh, that fell apart over time for the, the most usual reasons. She wanted more money and attention. He didn't know how to deal with it. Just I, the, what, what it's just because that they happen to we happen to be viewing it, but I think that the, I think that this is uh, similar to a whole hell of a lot of marriages, which is why you shouldn't do it. <laughs> That's where I'm at at the break here. These these are my deep thoughts. Right. I'm being honest. I'm, I'm I've been I've been watching the chat to see to see how how that goes. Yeah, this is a real Trevor City deal. The snowmobiling in the lakes and all that. I, I grew up there. I I know these are my people. I understand it. I'm close. But but ultimately, Grigsy's right. There you go. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Lock him up. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Trevor City is Nordic. It's a lot of Scandinavian. It's a lot, a lot of dirty Scandy up there. I got some in me myself. <laughs> And French. That's 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 who. That, that th those are the people apparently when it came across the pond and said, "Oh yeah, this is nice. This is freezing cold tundra here. Well, yeah, this this would be a good place to settle." Uh, yeah, of course, of course, it'd be Northern Europeans <laughs> who are used to a miserable climate. Who else is going to do it? Anybody else? Anyone? Anyone with? I mean, it's beautiful in the summer. It's absolutely gorgeous. But you don't want Alice with a lick of sense and be like, no, <laughs> this is not the spot. We'll be moving on. We're going to keep going. No, no, it's it's pretty up there. It, it is. It's good stuff. All right. All right. Well, I'm I'm going to I guess I'm going to hang out. I, I'm 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 in. I'm I'm into this now. I, I got to see what happened. I, I don't believe I don't believe the allegations that we started with that were ugly. Again, I wasn't there, but I just don't believe them. Neither did neither did the agencies that investigated it. And uh, do I think either one of them is perfect? No. Do I think that um, she is manipulative and will? Exaggerate all the way to lie to improve her situation in this divorce. Yes. That's what I've gathered. There you go. So everyone can freak out. All the simps can come out and tell me that I'm I'm a horrible person because I didn't, I didn't uh, swallow every word that came out of her mouth. Let's have it. Let's have it. <laughs> Do I think that, uh, I, first of all, it's general human nature for all people. It's, everything becomes gender issue at all the time. I just literally look at, at the, the situation, think, does this make sense? Does this does this conform to my experience? Uh, does their body language, what's my gut feeling from it? Those are my gut feelings. <laughs> we might even go that far. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's at the extreme, but I, I it, it's it's within range. I I think she she cares about her kids. I don't think she's the most awful person ever. I I do think that she is willing to say whatever it takes to improve her situation. However, that's the sense I get, and I think this guy was over his head. Uh, dealing with something he didn't understand like 99% of us. And uh, th th this is the result you get. I, I, I think that, I think that's what we're dealing with. All right. Did, did they, 
Oh no. Oh no. Is it is the hearing over? Or are they gonna start a new hearing? We'll start a new feed. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to just put this on pause and find the new feed. Because I don't want to. I, mean, I could close it down, but I might as well just keep it all as one stream. It's all related. If anybody gets a link, send it to me or tell me where it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know. Well, I guess I guess I'm on the channel. I guess I'm on the channel, so I'll look for a new one. <laughs> Worst YouTuber ever. I, I'm currently on the judge's channel. Yeah, I, I think we can make the logical leap <laughs> that if if they come back and start another stream, it'll also be on that channel. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's why you come here for that sort of genius. That sort of genius. All right, all right. I, I'm just, I'm gonna just put this on pause. I don't know what am I gonna do here. I'll just put, I'll just put my guy up. How do I do that? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll just roll with this. So we'll, we'll make this an all day deal. All right. Let me let me figure out where the next where the next feed's coming from. What's your name? Jesus from Uh Weslam Carlos Fazara Alves, is that what it is? My name is Jesus from Nazareth. All right. See, I'm going to use Ms. Fowler's words. She now is in a thruple. And not only does she choose to be in a thruple, and she's shacked up in the bed with the thruple. Now, if anybody thinks this is okay, I am in the wrong world. Say the words that she said or 
Sure. I need for you to tell me what went on. I'm, I'm not on that whole shit. I'm not with that whole shit. Ma'am, are you a whore? I object to the relevance of that, Your Honor. Oh. All right. What? I'll, I'll tie it up real quick, Judge. All yes, right, sir. go ahead. You're not a whore? <laughs> there was, there was, and I hate, God, I hate this. I saw a bunch of dick pussy, dick pussy, dick pussy, dick pussy. Dick pussy. Going back and forth between texts with one another, and I never want to hear it again. Any objection? All objections. I have to feel like I should be elected emperor of the world before I could be that arrogant, not show up for 
a sense. Like really, like top two. Top two. Only me and one other person get to run for emperor of the world. this today your honor my health is in jeopardy right now what's that i have ibs irritable bowel syndrome mm -hmm. and what what's been going on is very stressful i'm bleeding inside ma'am No cutting of teeth. Then the imposition is right. No cutting of teeth. I would like you to understand that I know what um, false identities are and sometimes famous people need them. Marshall Bruce Mathers, Eminem, at one point studied law and passed the bar exam to become a lawyer. If he still is a lawyer, I want you to get a hold of him for me so that I can communicate with him. DM Mishmelter. 
Thank you. Um, Mr. Kusman, just as a reminder, even though we took a break, you're still under oath. Um, I think where we left off was I was directing your attention to the previously admitted exhibit number 29, um, plaintiffs 29. Um, as a text message string that occurred between you and Ms. Klusterman in April of 2023. Um, in that exhibit, Ms. Klusterman testified to your uh, text message admitting, so to speak, to addictions. Do you recall that testimony? I do. Okay. Um, can you please explain the context of the conversation that occurred with you and Ms. Klusterman and why you were making these statements? I mean, I always try to diffuse the situation, but. Uh, um... Like, I don't really understand which I would like to see you get some counseling for your addictions. I mean, maybe she's assuming I'm addicted to pornography or something like that. Uh, well, in the text message string, um, overall, were you even discussing the children in general in anything here in this? No. Okay. So would you say that this conversation was about your marriage, which in April of 2023 was rapidly deteriorating, so to speak? Yes. Yeah, it was, it was about our, our relationship and marriage. Okay. Uh, we start with, I will always love you. Are you going to divorce me? You're an incredible wife. This is my fault. I know that. What's going on here? Uh, in, in April of 2023, was there an accusation that you were having an extramarital affair? I, she told me, she accused me of having an emotional affair. Uh, did you admit to that affair? Yeah, I texted to uh, people. Were you having an extramarital affair in your opinion? No, it was texting and communication and friends. I so, have females that are friends. So is that the context of why this conversation was happening? Yes. Between you and Ms. Kusterman? Yes. And again, this was not something, at least from your perspective, you ever showed to the children or that the children were involved oh, no, in this conversation? No, kids were not involved, never spread this. We never okay. talked like this in front of the kids. So in this, you're, you're talking about your phone. Your phone is a problem. You're saying, I'll, I'll give up my phone. Mm -hmm. Why are you offering that? to try to make our relationship and marriage work. And why is the phone the thing that you believed at that time would make your relationship work? Um, because Jen wanted access to all of my communication with anyone and everyone. And I said I would give up my phone and just do without if that would help us make things work. And, and we already went through some testimony with her uh, where she was texting you in April and May of 2023, demanding to see the Verizon account login um, and your text messages. Mm -hmm. And she made multiple demands in that time frame. Yeah. Okay. Um, about 40 in the context of about a month. That sounds pretty reasonable. Okay. Um, so that's what was going on in this, in this time frame of April of 2023, right? Correct. Okay. So you're, you know, I want to get down to like, your statement, the phone has caused so many addiction issues and her response, I would like to see you get some counseling for your addictions. Do you have an addiction? No, I have friends. I have friends that talk, text a lot. It's with multiple people, that's what it is. Has anybody in the mental health professional field ever um, diagnosed you with or even suggested that you have an addiction of any kind? No. In the context of this message, what specific addiction was being alluded to or addressed or discussed? Uh, Jen just thought I was overly secretive with my phone and... Did she accuse you of being addicted to your phone? Yeah, I mean, she has, yeah. Did she, and you mentioned addicted to pornography. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, uh, but I mean, she has told me I was. Okay. So when you said this phone has caused so many addiction issues, why were you saying that to Ms. Kusterman if you're now saying you don't have any addiction issues? to diffuse the situation because for a long time in this, I wanted to try to make our marriage work. Um, I, I, I didn't want the kids to be in a broken home. Um, and to the extent that she's accused you of being addicted to your phone or pornography, has she ever said that that affected your ability to parent your children? No, no. Um, my, my kids come first in everything I do and Jen knows that. Um, in April of 2023, were you trying to save your marriage? Absolutely. Were you willing to, at least at that time, go along with what Ms. Klusterman wanted? I mean, to a certain extent. 
to the extent that she said you have an addiction you were willing to say okay fine i do let's move on with that yeah even though you didn't really believe you had an addiction no no i, I didn't have an addiction i wanted to do what it took to try to get along and, and make things work for the longest time i thought it was best to try to make it work for the kids and i'm not sure jen thought the same thing with respect to your phone usage or even pornography of any kind, have you ever not been present for your children or able to meet their day-to-day -day needs? No, no. I, my kids are my world. I put them first in everything I do. Uh, they are everything to me. Like to direct your attention to plaintiff's previously admitted exhibit 34 here. Pull that up. Um, Ms. Kusterman presented this text message exchange from April of 2023 regarding discussing leaving your daughter's game early. Do you recall that testimony in that text message? Yes, I do. Did you leave that game early? Um, yes, I did. It's, it, it was a softball game. It's always a double header. I showed up uh, towards the beginning of the first one and watched all of that and then uh, noticed uh, Callie giving Jen some attitude, uh, maybe taking acceptance of some coaching. I may have said some things directed at coaching too or things that she could do better. Uh, for whatever reason, Callie was in a bad mood that day. Uh, kind of gave Jen some attitude that I didn't agree with, gave me attitude and she didn't seem to even want to be there. And I said, I was kind of, uh, if, if, if you don't want to be here, then why should I be here? But I watched, I mean, I watched some, but um, I, 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 I left and I, I'm not gonna, I, 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 Jen's given her time to coaching her and if she's gonna have an attitude and um, not uh, give her best effort or take to Jen's coaching or my coaching if, it's, if I'm the coach at that time or trying to help her, then I'm, gonna maybe uh, go get dinner started or go back to work or help another child or, but I mean, I think that's quite overblown. Uh, do you typically leave games early for your children? No, no, no. that may honestly be the only time I ever have. Uh, I, there's nothing I'd rather do than watch my kids sports. Uh, obviously, I mean, Jen and I have always worked as hard as we can to give our kids every opportunity to do the things that they love. And I, I know Jen feels the same way. And we love watching our kids play the thing and do the things that they love. And she testified that she felt like you were leaving set a poor example of support for your child. Um, do you agree that that's what happened that day? No, I disagree with that. Did you talk to your daughter about her performance that day? And you said her attitude? Yeah. I, yeah I, definitely did and uh, I, I, I'm not going to support um, I mean in that situation Callie for one needs to act like that's the coach and forget the fact that she's her mom and show the respect uh, we're only there to try to help her um, and support her and help her become the softball player volleyball player whatever sport it is we're there to support her um, but that day was kind of rare Callie um, and and I decided that I wasn't going to stick around for that type of behavior. Um, but also that text string, you left to go get dinner started. You right. stated, right? Right. Was that dinner for the whole family? Yes, absolutely. So you didn't like leave to go to the casino or go drink at a bar or something like that. No, it was to prepare dinner for when Jen and right. the girls uh, came home and um, go on with our evening. Did you feel like so, uh, preparing dinner for the family was supporting your children's needs and interests? as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, and like you testified, that that was an isolated incident, that April game, right? Yes. Um, since then, have you attended games and sporting events for your children? As many as possible. I mean, the, the, the PPO played a role in that some away games are too far for me to attend or can't afford to go or whatever, but we make everything that we can try, try to. Um, this away for now here. Ms. Lusterman alleged um, that you tell sexual or inappropriate jokes to the children. In her testimony, she used an example of a joke about a potato and IHOP. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, I do. Did you tell the children these jokes? I did not, actually. We were uh, we 
were out on Lake Leona. I was out on Lake Leona with the kids on Memorial Day with my cousin and his wife and some other families. And we were all hanging out. And it was actually uh, one of the other families, 10 year olds, that told the kids those jokes. Uh, can you control every influence or everything that is said to or around your children as they're getting older and involved in social activities, have friends on sports teams in school? No, I, I can't control everything. So sometimes your kids might hear inappropriate jokes from other parents right. or other kids or right. other places. Right. Um, and the two specific examples she gave, it's your testimony that you didn't tell the kids those I jokes. I did not tell the kids those jokes. It was, uh, it was actually my cousin's 10-year-old daughter that told those jokes. Um, Ms. Klusterman alleged that your son Calvin likes to work with you in landscaping um, in the summer months and wants to earn money. Um, but her testimony was that you did not always pay him. Is that true? I mean, maybe when he was younger, I didn't pay him, but we also pay a lot of money into his activities. But this summer, um, I uh, actually did pay him, gave him some of the money he earned. The rest of it is uh, under control of my mother right now. Um, I uh, have The kids have bank accounts with the kid and Jen's name on them um, because I'm working on getting my mortgage. My mortgage guy told me, do not open any bank accounts, buy anything. So I cannot open the bank account with my name and Kelvin's name on it. So my mom is currently under uh, control of that money. I mean, it's being held for Kelvin. Yeah, yeah, as soon as I can open that savings account for him, that's where it's going. Kelvin knows that. He's been made aware of that. I still give Kelvin some spending money. I still advise Kelvin that we shouldn't just spend all of it. That we should try to save it, trying to create good spending habits um, and, and all that. But no, Kelvin is being rewarded for the work that he is doing. Uh, during the summer, this last summer, 2023, did Ms. Klusterman allow Calvin to go work with you on the weeks she had the children? No, she did not. Um, even though her testimony was that Calvin likes to work with you to earn money. Yes, it, um, he very much does. And it, it, that, was a, that was a tough situation because then uh, Calvin was not happy about that situation. And, I mean, and that's Jen, that was Jen's decision and he needs to go by what she says. Um, during her testimony, Ms. Klusterman discussed that gifts are her love language, which is fine. I think you said that in your testimony, yes, too. Absolutely. Oh, Do you recall, good Lord. Um, Do you recall that she testified about a Lululemon bag that the children gave her, and she was really excited about that because mm -hmm. gifts are her love language? Yes. Do you know anything about that Lululemon bag? I do. Uh, <laughs> I bought that bag. Shoot me now. Girls to the Lululemon store and pick that out and paid for that. And they were very excited about that. And, and it seems Ms. Klusterman was also excited to receive that yeah, absolutely. as well since yeah. she brought it to you. We've had the phrases love language and a reference to Lululemon. I, I don't know how much longer I can last. The attention of the court to testify right. that she received that. Right. Okay. Um, going in the kind of vein of gifts or her love language, was there, um, a private and personal marital sort of banter between you and her about gifts and money did you in talk your, nerdy? Yes. private marital relationship <laughs> yes was that between the two of you yeah this yeah but i mean we get this closer and alleged sort oh of yeah that baby you demand sexual favors in exchange for gifts i got a couple money. c notes in the Is bedroom that true? <laughs> i wouldn't demand it I never demanded anything, and, and Jen made just as many of those offers to me as I did to her. And she's illicit by asking for things and offering to do sexual favors. Absolutely. That, um, that, that was a playful thing between Jen and I. Okay. And did you feel that that was responding to her gifts are my love language issue in a way? Like yeah, she was asking for, way. okay. Um, I want to be really clear. At any time, did Ms. Klusterman not have any, not have access to the money and the finances of the marriage? Jen always had. Did you ever utter the phrase "only good girls get Lululemon"? Access to, to all, all of our money, bank accounts, <laughs> anything. So if there was ever buy me this thing, she could have gone and bought it for herself, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we would have discussions about not spending money, but no, she always had the opportunity to buy it. I never I didn't control that. <laughs> was Was there even an issue during the marriage that Miss Klusterman would take money from the business bank account um, of Klusterman Landscaping Business yeah. without telling you? Yeah, it happened. So she had access even to your business bank account. Yes. yes. And she's not a business. She's not part of the business. Well, not anymore. I mean, that was your employment, so to speak. Yeah. The marriage. I mean, she was employed elsewhere. Too was since we separated. Right, but during the marriage, she she wasn't operating the business in the sense of managing it, working it. She but had she her helped, own. Yeah, she, she she helped when she was available. But, but she had her own job. Yeah, she had her own job. Okay, and that was your 
how you earn money for your family. Right? Correct, correct. Um, and she had access to even that account. Correct. So to the extent that it was, I'll buy you this or give you this amount of money, she could have taken it. Absolutely. I never and, restricted and, her. Or and did she it. actually take money out of bank accounts when she wanted it? Yeah. I, yeah. Um, she never lacked access to any of the marital funds. No, she had access to everything. Um, Ms. Klusterman claimed that you work late in the summer months, often until dark. Is that true? Uh, that I mean, that's a pretty broad statement. The only time I, if, if the kids have a sporting event or the kids want to go boating or something like that, I am always done when those things want to be done. The times where I work till dark might be a Thursday night because we're leaving Friday as soon as I'm done to go to Mackinac Island or for a sporting event. Um, but if the kids had anything going as far as sports, I never missed any of those games. I would only work longer hours the night before, the night after, or you know when we returned from Mackinac Island or whatever. I always did whatever I had to do to make those trips happen. And, and sometimes I had to work till dark. But if, if it was something where the kids and Jen wanted to go boating or do stuff with friends, I, I always chose to do those things. And then just maybe the next night I had to put in more hours to get my work done. But um, we. Uh, we played pretty hard as a, as a family, and then and Jen and I both did everything that we could to make those things happen for the kids. And um, this last summer, did you <clears throat> did you adjust your work schedule based on when you had the kids in your care versus not? I sure did. Um, so were you working late nights and into the dark hours of the day when you had your kids in your care this summer? Uh, never. I would actually, when I get the kids at 6 p.m. on Sunday, um, knowing that I would uh, work long hours Friday, work all day Saturday, work all day Sunday, and then I would maybe take Monday off, take Tuesday off. But I never, I never worked long hours when I had the kids. Um, it, it's always when the kids were with Jen, I was working those hours to create time to um, make time for the kids and do things that they want to do. And we had uh, days during the week where we went voting all day because I was able to, to work and get those things done on the weekend or whatever, or when they went back to gym. Um, in the winter months, does work slow down for you? Yes, it's uh, very inconsistent. When it, when it snows, I work. When it, it doesn't, uh, I don't. Um, what do you do when work slows down in the winter months? Um, I uh, clean the house, do the laundry, all the things that need to be done around the house, make the dinners, and more likely to make dinner that time of year than in the summertime. Um, more time to help take the kids to their appointments, uh, things like that, whatever needs to be done. But yeah, I, I always made sure the house was clean when they were coming home and um, spent my day doing those things. And in the winter, Miss um, Wisserman was still working. <laughs> right. Yep. So you were at home kind of doing those things for the Hence family. the crying. Right. Okay. Yeah, and when the kids were not in school, I mean, it was the same way. I was home cleaning the house, taking care of the kids, all of that stuff while she was working. Um, do you miss sporting events for your children so that you can be at work? No, no, I don't. I, I, I always stop to uh, uh, be at those events. Uh, even uh, the, this fall, Calvin played in a hockey game, and uh, I, I remember <laughs> it, the, the uh, PPO was still on at that point, and I didn't feel comfortable being in an ice rink with Jen. Um, and Calvin said, hey, we play... Uh, games that this time and I took the kids boating in between I'm sorry yeah, you're, I took the kids boating uh in between I stopped work to take the kids wakeboarding some of his teammates and him, um and then went back to work uh, but I only missed the games when uh, the PTO and I didn't feel comfortable being around Jen. Um do you coach for your children? Yeah I do. What what teams do you coach? Uh at one point or another I've coached all of them in uh, baseball, softball done football, we've done volleyball and basketball and everything. Um, yeah, this, this, um, this summer I coached uh, the youngest Kelsey's softball team. Um, Ms. Klusterman claimed in her testimony that you're too hard on the children with respect to sports, that you disparage and belittle them. Do you feel that you do that? I don't belittle them, no. With the girls, uh, it's, it's positive all around. Um, I mean, they like to be pushed, but uh, it's it's never negative or what you did wrong. It's great job. Uh, Kelvin, on the other hand, he he is uh, very driven. He wants to know what he does wrong, um, so he can be better. Um, I mean, he wants to be the best, um, and so we push him. Uh, Jen does the exact same thing that I do. Um, he likes to know what he does what he does wrong. He likes to be pushed. 
he absolutely wants to be the best and he would tell you that he wants us pushing him. Um, and is that why you maybe had tougher conversations with Calvin about sports? Absolutely. He 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 want he wants to know what he didn't do right. He wants to be pushed. And you observed Miss Fisherman doing that as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, she knows that he he wants to be pushed, and she pushes him. And um, but I've never pushed the girls like that because uh, I know that they don't want that. Um, it's it's just different with them. I can I can read them. There's actually times that with Callie playing hockey, I've asked Jen to cool it because she will push a little harder than what I think Callie wants. Um, yeah, I mean. Jen knows that the kids want to be pushed and want to be, you know, the best that they can be. Um, but I, I mean, I know she thinks that I push him a little hard, but I think he would tell you that that's what he wants. I only want the best for him. It's not like I'm mad. I'm not mad at him. I'm helping him and trying to help him be the best that he can be because that's what he wants. His ultimate goal is to play college football or college hockey. He wants to be the best on the team, whatever team that is. And I feel like I help him do that, and, and Jen does too. She, she wants him to be the best and wants his goals to come to fruition. Um, so I want to talk about Exhibit 19, which was a video and audio recording um, between you and Ms. Boosterman, where you were in the bedroom. Do you recall that video? I do. Okay, that was the one that we had to go off the record to view. Oh. One moment, please. Oh. <laughs> Really wants to be part of that conversation. There I go. Apologize. Um, so exhibit 19. Um, I want to I want to ask you about that. Um, you recall that video? That was the one we had to go off the record to talk about and view. Okay, that was you and Miss Kusterman in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, in Miss Kusterman's testimony, she claimed children were in the room during that discourse between you and her. Do you recall her testifying to that? I do. Was that true? There was no children in the room. Um. And based on the video we saw, we didn't see any children in the video, did we? No. We didn't hear any other voices than yours and Ms. Kusterman's. Correct. Um, did you feel that that was a private conversation between you and your wife at that time? Absolutely. Um, we, I, I try very hard to not have arguments, any of any adult conversations in front of the children. Um, would you have said the things that you say in private to your wife? As adults, would you say those things in front of your children? No, absolutely not. Um, her testimony that one of your daughters was coming in and out of the room or was in the room. Not true? Not true. Not true. Did you believe your children were even in earshot while that conversation was happening? No, because if we're having a conversation like that, the door's closed. Um, Ms. Kusterman appeared unclothed in that video. Is it common for her to walk around without clothes on in front of all of the children? Um, I mean, it's been a common occurrence with Kelvin getting a little older. It's kind of stopped in front of him, or she at least makes sure she's faced the other direction, which I still don't love. But she's, uh, I understand her mindset, but I don't always agree with what she says why she does that. But. Um, we already uh, we talked about the parental restrictions on the phone. Um, I'd like to turn your attention to defendant's proposed exhibit A. Um, do we need to screen share that? Or I, I know I've, it's been a while, but I previously shared that with the court and opposing counsel. I'll let you handle it. If, if there are issues, you can handle it however you'd like. Um, well, I'm just pulling this up for my clients. So one moment here. So I need to go through some uh, Defendant's Exhibit A is a series of pictures and images to lay a foundation. I need to go th through those with my client. I have it up on my screen. Um, again, I don't know if the court would prefer to share a screen or if we're all just independently viewing it. Your Honor, and I will stipulate that these are pictures of the defendant and the children so that we can kind of fast forward the foundation part of it. I don't have any issues with them uh -oh. coming in or any foundation issues. If there's... Pictures with the kids. I'm not doing that. Admit exhibit A. That's fine. All right. It's uh, admitted. Thank you. We're going to go through um, them, but we're going to go. We've got two minutes, so we're breaking for lunch. So. Okay. Would we like to break now, and then I can ask questions about these pictures, or um, would we like me to go through the pictures and then break? I'm okay with whatever. Okay, because I think I might need more than two minutes. 
minutes, but I should. Well, no, I wasn't suggesting that you had a two minute time frame. It was whether you wanted to use these two minutes to ask and then we come back. We can okay. just, I wasn't going to put a two minute time frame on your presentation. All right. So I will. Well, I guess that's that. We're 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 out of video. All right. I guess I guess I'll close this down. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Do you want to come back and see the gripping finale of this? <laughs> or have you had enough? <laughs> yeah, the, the judge was getting hangry and he was annoyed that they had to take a break because he would because now and now I see why. They were they were pretty close to it. All right. Well, we'll come back after, but I don't want I don't want pictures of minors on here. So I I'll have to figure it out. Maybe I'll just maybe I'll just play it. Maybe I'll just play it um until they until they get done with the exhibits. All right, all right. I'll I'll do I'll do part 2. After lunch, I've got some calls to make. I probably, I probably have uh, some cranky people. I probably, I probably have to talk to Yesenia. I'm guessing they'll be back in about an hour, so I'll, I'll put up another stream what, what, as soon as I see it. Come on, all right. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just to get, it was just about to get good too. Just about to get good. All right. All right. Well, we'll we'll check back in after lunch. See y'all soon.